Right, this is going to be another episode of Snake and Banter. And our guest for this one, joining myself and Maui Snake, is Donna, a.k.a. Donna CS Go, who, if you're from the German scene, spoiler, I don't imagine that many people from the German scene watch my content. It's usually quite humorous and frivolous in many ways. So, and it's in English. But she's obviously was doing interviews and stuff in the German scene. If you watch Owner Pixel Stream and other cursed fan base who probably don't watch my content, but who knows, maybe they do. You obviously also saw her there doing interviews with the phone with all people like Zewu and Apex at the major. And then also on the side, it's public information, she is the girlfriend of Nexa from G2, which by the way, I actually think that's the intro point here, Donna, because here's the question I have, right? Which mm-hmm. is, were you at all intimidated? Was there anything making you nervous about coming on this show? Because the people have seen, there's been a little bit of spicy bag of You went at Maui one time over that Nafani comment, the she raw joke or whatever. Obviously, you've, you've had a few angles on me. Although we'll see, if you notice, <laughs> this is why actually I think we're doing this show. On your last message, one thing I will say is this. People on Twitter, by default, tend to be quite argumentative and you can't see what the person's saying. You just see the text. So it's really easy, especially for from different cultures, to take like offence to what people say. But if you notice, yeah. I didn't try to just like dismiss your comment to me about like, like Astralis or whatever it was, I just tried in good faith to respond and see see what would happen by offering a little olive branch. And in this one case, guys, maybe maybe this is a new Thorin, maybe it's a new era, maybe 2024, we're all just friends now, what do you think? Can it happen? I mean, why not? Uh, honestly, I think uh, Twitter is always very dramatic in general sure. and uh, people can get heated. I myself as well sometimes, but you know, I feel like some people take things more seriously than, the, than, their, um, than it is. Um, I remember you made some TikTok thing. I think it's when I found, <laughs> yeah, it was a whole Nafani thing <laughs> that kind of exploded. And then I was writing to uh, to Maui like, "Oh, that sounds like an HLTV comment." <laughs> there you go. There you go. And uh, then you made the TikTok, but you know, like I don't take things like this too hard, to be honest, because um, it's just how it is. And I think sometimes people like just like reading things they don't really know how it's meant you know sometimes you're like you don't really mean it in an evil way yes and it can come it can come across like more harsh um especially if you don't use emojis and stuff uh but yeah i think everything is cool and uh i'm super here i'm super glad to be here honestly um i've watched a few episodes and uh yeah I'm excited. <laughs> okay. I actually think this will be a fun episode because if people don't know, one of the reasons why Donna has commented on a bunch of things about players and teams is she obviously knows some of the players and she has her own relationships with them and might know information about their team. Sometimes, as we do, sometimes we're friends to them that people might not know. So I think actually we could probably get into this more than people realize. Now, here's the thing. I agree with you about Twitter. The problem is people take it too to heart. What they should do, Maui, logically, is, you know, the famous saying, like, you've got to sleep on it. You've got to, like, wait and then let, let yourself think, like, oh, get a bit of distance. So basically... Overnight, sleep on it, and then in the morning, in the AM, into the AM, as it were, Maui, then what you could do is you could present a whole new face to the world. Because obviously, me and Maui, if people don't know, are wearing into the AM t-shirts here, which is our lovely sponsor. I've got kind of like a cool cyberpunk-style Japanese one. He's got like a, a Hawaii-style yeah, palm, cool. palm tree. <laughs> to be fair, he is Maui Snake. That makes sense. If people don't know, this is actually a brand where they don't even give us a whole a load of copy to it. They basically just say, you get the t-shirt. What do you think of it? Tell your fans. So I'll actually say, obviously, we've done this on our shows in League of Legends, me and Monty are actually very complimentary of this brand. Like I'll say in general, I'm not a massive t-shirt guy, but that's actually because I tend to be, this is why I think Maui will have an interesting take. I tend to just be a pleb, mate. I go to like those stores in Europe that are just the cheap mass production ones and I just buy like 10 of the same t-shirt like Dexter's Lab and I just have the same t-shirt and I don't, at the time I don't really go for quality. I just go like, is it a cool design? Is it reasonably cheap? But I'm not a guy who wears it the expensive stuff. So I have to say the quality of this is way better than the t-shirts I'm wearing, mate. And even though I've actually had this one, this one's been through a couple of washes. still retained all the softness it's got like that cottony feel it's lovely and I, I just like the fact the design's not like it's not some like obnoxious meme like this will actually look cool in like five years man. it's just a cool design in it so i think it's fine what do you think about you're known as something of the art of the fashionista you know you know more than me about i bet you have those actual real basic t-shirts that cost like 200 dollars something don't you come on hit me with your take on this maui <laughs> yeah, obviously, I'm a bit of a t-shirt connoisseur wearing a variety of, of highly sought after brands. Yes. But I think that this one, this one is, uh, it's 100% cotton, first of all, and you can just tell that it's actually really soft. It's kind of like, like, what I want from a t-shirt is 
either I want it to look really cool or I want to be able to do a lot with it. And by that, I mean, I can wear this in a lot of different settings. And also I can wear this to the gym. Like that's a big thing for me. Can I wear my t-shirts to the gym or are they uncomfortable or are they too heavy? And let me tell you, the the fabric is just so soft on the skin. Like I'm pro I'm going to work out later today and I'm just going to, I'm just going to go in this t-shirt. Like I don't care. Like I'm just, so that's uh, it's, it's, it's super breathable too. And so yes. it never feels like the, the graphic yes. itself is like too heavy. Like sometimes the screen print on things is just too much. And like this, uh, this does not have that problem whatsoever. So yes. yeah, I, I could recommend, I could recommend it is just a, a easily a shirt to wear to the gym. I wouldn't even say, by the way, Maui, that's actually an underrated aspect. If people don't know, you might have seen, I don't tend to wear T-shirts doing these shows, do I? I do loads of shows, but I'm always wearing like a very generic, if you know, it's like a five-side football jersey I wear, basically. But that's because the problem with a normal T-shirt is, like you say, normal T-shirts aren't breathable, actually. Like the most, the reason I wear those football jerseys is because they're actually designed to let the air come in and out so that when you sweat and you play football, you don't get overheated and feel like you have to die 10 minutes in. So I actually think the breathable aspects are one of the best parts. When I did this show yesterday, I did the four horsemen yesterday, one of this, and I didn't get halfway through like my temperature felt like I was having a fever or something. So anyway, speaking of a frenzy, you can obviously get 10% off your own into the air purchase using our link in the description box below. And as well, they also have a bunch of deals. They ship loads of places around the world where like you can get three graphic tees. So this style for $61.95 and you can get three basic tees in a bundle for $52.95 and as well as getting 10% off your order, you can get 10% off those bundles if you use our link in the description box below. So thank you for Into the AM sponsoring this episode. Right, Donna, it's all, it's all good now. Now we can talk for real. Now we can get into... <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm the only one, as I tell everyone, who knows all the topics. Because I just have to check that no one had the same topic, basically, so that we don't okay, have like yeah. only four and a half or something. So, <laughs> but I already know, I'll warn you right now, there's some spice coming later. It's not even from me. Maui's, oh. Maui's got an interesting one that he's crafted just for you to potentially <laughs> make it spice. But that's later on. It's all good. It's something you've been Wait, talking about recently. Did you invite way. me to roast me? No, 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 no. Here's the thing. That's just an incidental byproduct of the process. We're not, you know, that just, if that happens, that's like the, that's like the rain. It comes or it goes. We didn't intend it though. So here's where we'll start though. The good news is we always start with the guest and we always start with the good category. So what good point are you bringing to the show, Donna? Uh, so my good point is uh, Esperanto's comeback. I don't know um, if a lot of people have it, uh, like, how do you say it in English? Fuck. Oh, sorry. Uh, on the you can screen, swell on the show. Don't worry about that. I'm going to be doing it all. Let's get ready. So. <laughs> okay. Huh. Uh, so I don't know if a lot of people, like, paid attention to it because I think especially people who maybe have not followed eSport for, like, uh, the last, like, few years, but maybe just, like, you know, are starting out now or last year or something, don't even know his name. Oh, sure. Um, but yeah, Esperanto, um, he, I would say his peak, uh, career peak was when he made it to the major with crazy. It was also back then yes. with next and Hunter and the team. Yeah. I also know Esperanto personally from this time back then, um, he was playing before in Valiance. They just like rebranded, uh, crazy. I think Letney and Otto were in the lineup as well. Uh, so it was kind of like a, a team, I would say like tier two team that unexpectedly made it to the major and um qualified and yeah i think at this point like he got more attention to it uh, after that uh, hunter nexa uh went to g2 and then they got sold to a, a org named content contact um or they branded it contact i don't know to keep the core because back then you had still the rule that if you made it to the major you keep the core you are yes. you know you're the next one yes um so yeah this was kind of like the storyline and um he got a lot of attention at this time um being the star player of the team having insane performance and i have to say esperanto he absolutely has a gift for the game um, I cannot uh, speak about it now because I would have to see him performing now, with especially CS2 and everything. But at the time back then, um, he was kind of like special, I would say, in his like personal decision making and uh, mechanical s skills, absolutely um, top uh, tier one material. But the problem was that he was like, <clears throat> yeah, his kryptonite, I would say, was like attitude and um, <coughs> lack of motivation and immaturity which he also um, admitted. He did a, a HLTV interview recently that he's coming back. And the reason for it is that he went through a military, he went through, uh, at the, he went to military and he um, finished like his years there. And he said that it taught him a lot about like discipline and having routines and things. And that this might help him in the future to like literally keep a normal routine that every player has in a team, like waking up, um, going to practice, doing the theory, having then your own personal aim routine and stuff like that, um, which he didn't really like, um, yeah, stick to. 
And uh, yeah, of course, so far it's just an interview. You don't know if if this is like, you know, sure. it's really going to happen. But I'm very excited about it because I always found it very sad that he kind of like disappeared from the scene. It was just like a, a talent that, you know, couldn't really be shaped yet, you know. And um, I have high hopes for him, honestly. I think he can grind his way to the top. And if he really is true, like if he sticks to what he said, then um, I'm I'm confident that you will see his name way more often in the future. Okay. Thoughts, Maui? If people don't remember, Esperanto was just a massive mechanical talent as a rifler. Uh, def watching him play, I feel like his name was frequently mentioned in the likes of people like Xantarez, where you would just be like, this guy is a human aimbot. Uh, I remember him playing outside yard on train and just, just destroying people with pure mechanics there, especially uh, even when he was on that dysfunctional contact lineup. So there were a lot of things to be really excited about with Esperanto. Uh, I didn't know that the reason he stepped away from the game until this HLTV article was the fact that he had all these discipline problems. Uh, the one line that I really liked in it was when he talked about the fact that when, when he was in the forest, cold and hungry, he then kind of had visions or thought about the fact that he wanted <laughs> okay. to come back okay. to the game more than anything. And he's, or like he was he's thinking, right in the script like, of his own fucking career already. I love it. Okay, that's going to be a great that scene. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so so for him, I I, I actually kind of want to relate it a little bit to just experience I have before where, I mean, I played like a, a lot competitively when I was in middle school and high school and then going through college and not really touching the game at all. It took until kind of the end of college where I was like looking back at it and I was like, man, that does that did beat just the nine to five grind that did beat just like having to work through academia or anything like that. And I think anybody that takes uh, like zooms out on on life and has a greater perspective will realize that if you're able to make it work in esports or counter strike specifically then it just beats practically everything that's that out, that's out there so it it's something where I'm, I'm glad he did this for himself and i hope that i hope that it's more than just talk you know i hope that he actually backs it up with his actions in the server because if if he's able to reach even 90% of the mechanics, 80% of the mechanics that he had before, but is able to take a better mindset towards teamwork and discipline, then this guy is going to be a phenom once again. And the thing is that when you brought this up, Donna, I looked up his age and I was surprised he's still only 22. Well, yeah. Like, yep. that's crazy. Like, yep. I, I felt like he was playing for years and I would have assumed he's probably now in his mid 20s. And it's like, you know, when you're in your young 20s, you can still grind this game. You can still really focus on this. If you're coming back and he's, say, 28, I'd be like, OK, yeah. you're going to fall off and probably you're, <laughs> you're going to you're going to you're going to just like try to find another job after like six months because you won't be able to to kick it. But no, I'm super excited. Great point, Donna. I, I really do hope that that Esperanto is going to make it work again, because, uh, man, like that crazy lineup in particular, they had a really sick line, uh, sick run at that star ladder major mm -hmm. one BO three away from making it to the playoffs. And yeah. even beyond that, like even in some some bad lineups afterwards, Esperanto was still a bright spot. Sure. I mean, the cool thing about this point is I actually think even if someone didn't know the story, he hadn't done the interview, just returning to the scene itself is good because as you say, he is a mega talent. Like if people don't know, this is actually a player where I actually consider my eye test to be pretty good. Like it's the reason why I think some players are mad overrated. But this is a player where from the beginning, I'm talking about like, as we're saying, maybe like a 17 year old player, the eye test is crazy for this player. Like he's really mechanically good guys. Like to yeah. a level that's like, I don't mean as in he, everyone could say it, they've got talent because everyone who's a pro has some level of talent or skill. This guy, even among other pros, like as we're saying, he was basically 17 or 18 when he did all the things we just talked about. And he was a stud right out the gate. Like if people don't know, he won like a dream hack with a team called The Imperial, not the Brazilian Imperial. It was actually a lineup <laughs> that was the one famous scene that had Crystal in because had that drama afterwards. And if people go back and look at this dream hack summer in 2018 that he won, all the lineups there are like players you will know now. They're like mega, there's like Optic, North, like there's the Red Reserve with all like Hampus and Freddie Bean all the, there's loads of players here that you know and this guy was the MVP of that tournament and he was stomping this tournament guys as in if people don't get that was where the whole attitude thing first publicly came from because he won this LAN and then went after the LAN and basically said like right kick Crystal out he shit it was the IGL because famously Crystal was like a low fragging IGL and so that's where people got a sense of like oh there's a bit of diva in this guy though like even though he's won the tournament he sort of doesn't acknowledge like the role Crystal plays he, he sort of thinks like a kid would like he didn't frag enough so get a fragger in so 
already there was the hint that that was going on. But the reason why, if people don't know, I'm actually in a weird way connected to this story because what happened was I myself was just going through some old DMs and I just happened to see this one because I've actually DM'd with him a few times over the years. I'd actually sent him a big message. If people have ever seen where I did those public letters, I did one to Config famously, I did one for Simple, where it was, yeah. it was always people like this. It's people where every player they've played with tells you privately, like, he's unbelievable. He might be like the best player I've ever played with. But then they'll also go, but, and then you find out all these personality problems or issues in the team or reasons why sometimes they'll even say, he's the best player I've played with, like they say about Config, but I don't want to play with him. And you think, what? And so I, it was all those players. I get really interested by players like that because I know, like Simple, if you can ever turn the corner on your personality and only your talent then gets judged instead of all these negatives, you'll be the best. You can just be like the best player in the world. You can win everything. So if you ever read that letter I wrote to Simple, I even say in it, like, if you want to win everything, you're, you don't actually need to work on your skills anymore, mate. You need to just apply yourself to, like, teamwork in the way that you worked on your skills to get as good as you are. Because this is a player where I, I since I didn't actually do it as a public letter, I did a DM. Well, I thought at the time, because it's been years since we heard of him now at tier one, I thought he's obviously never coming back, is he? Because when I actually said that DM, he initially did just ghost me on it and he never messaged to anyone. And then they just gradually went and eventually just disappeared from online play. If people don't know at the end of like 2022. So I thought randomly, actually, this was an example of a mega talent, which as he said, Donna, sadly, because 2019 was so many years ago, people aren't going to remember him or they're going to just be fans who came along the online so they won't know this guy was essentially like I would say unironically this was a player that had talent that was comparable to players like Donk these people yeah. that are coming along now that are like blowing everyone's minds and like I say he was also doing it right out the gate as like a 17 and 16 or that's just crazy to me so the reason I wrote that DM is because if you go and read it like I, I was very serious in that like that's a player where like if I've heard loads of stories from loads of your teammates and coaches and they're all telling me like I say on the one hand you're the best player I've played with but on the other hand I don't want to play with you the problem's obvious there. That's why if you notice, I'm basically just telling him, like, get your shit together, mate. Like, if you could, you could just be the best. Like, you could be one of the fucking top players in this game. And so what's cool is, actually, before he did this public thing, he actually did DM me. I guess what happened was, when I did this tweet, someone obviously who knew him must have just gone and messaged him. And he did actually reply to me in DM and sort of say some of the things he said in that HLTV interview. Like, actually, I'm going to come back. I'm going to play again. Like, like, believe it or not, you were sort of right. Like, when I was in the military, I've, I've sort of re rethought my whole life and I've realized I needed to be more disciplined and just tell it alone. It was cool. Because actually, here's the thing. I won't say about some of the past ones whether they really believed what they said or not, but you can always say the right things and go, yes, or it's like at school as a little kid, you know, when they tell you off and you have to show, you know, you don't believe it, but you say what they tell you, like, yes, yes, I've let everyone down and I won't do it again and it was wrong of me. But like, you just do that because you want, you know, that's what they want to hear. This actually yeah. did genuinely sound like he really believed it. Like this experience has sort of changed him a bit. I agree with you though, is that the, the point is though, that's all good, but you still have to reserve judgment. You still have to actually show it's real. Like, it's all well and good to do the interview. He did a great job with that. But, uh, but here's the thing, though. Like I said at the end, if you know how good this guy was, though, I think it would be really exciting to have this player back in the scene. And I'll even throw this out there. Uh -huh. He's probably picked the best time ever to come back. Because as Maui says, he's not some 27-year-old who everyone's going to forget about. He's still right in the prime of his youth. And even better, dude, when he left the scene, the joke of teams like crazy was, there was only about three or four international teams back then. Mate, there are like 20 teams he could could be on now. It could be on loads. It could think about all the international squads we have. This guy, if people don't know, he's Lithuanian. So yeah, by the way, he has totally fluent English. And I'd even imagine, I'd imagine he probably speaks a bit of Russian or something, right? He could probably go any team he wanted to, right? I'd imagine he can go yeah. where he wanted, Donna. He could absolutely go everywhere. And I think every team that will get him in the future, if he really sticks to what he says, as I said, uh, they will have uh, an upgrade. Honestly, like he's like just uh, absolute star player material. And I think we need like, you know, players like him to, to I mean, you can see what Donk is doing with Spirit. Yeah. Like, just imagine you have like a second Donk. I mean, I'm not saying that he's going to be the second no, Donk. No, no, sure. Be his own person. But um, like, he's just like, it, it's just like not also his mechanic skill, but he's also very intelligent. He's like very, he's a smart player. And this is also something I think that maybe was kind of a, Mm, a negative point uh, back then because um, there was like I think moments where he maybe would not uh, listen to a player if he would think that he knows better you know sure and I think going to the military also probably taught him of um, respecting other people and authority you know so this is something I think that's also very important 
And um, also like this thing that you mentioned with Crystal, you know, I think this maybe would have something like this would have not happened if you would have like that experience right. before, you know? Yes. Um, and it always comes like also, especially like kicking like a low fragging IGL or something comes often is being often pushed by the star players who are like, yes, okay, of course. he cannot have five frags when I'm carrying all the time, you know? But I think this always comes from like lack of experience and a bit of immaturity. But yeah, like just like to like uh, round it up, uh, I think 22 as awesome always had super young. And um, I think he could be like very, um, oh God, Bereicherung in English. Um, <laughs> an upgrade for him. There's okay, another word like, I'm looking for, okay. a synonym, but it's okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm just like, I'm super excited. I'm just like really, really hope that um, we're going to see ac actions and not just words. Yes. By the way, in case no one's aware, even though technically English is sort of a Germanic language, spoiler, as you just saw there, not even vaguely connected. Like, I had no clue what she said there. Couldn't have said anything. But actually, I've got one last point on this, which ties into actually what I was talking about before. Here's how I actually do know that over the years, the problem people have is they make out like someone could do a 180 transformation and be a totally different person. No, no, that's not even what you need. I've always told players like this that are difficult. Mate, if you even just took like 5%, 10% off the attitude, they'd be enough. Because at that point, your talent so much, they will forgive you any of the star player. You can get it, you can get away with being a bit of a demon. Your problem is you can't, like you say here, you can't actually ruin the team and make people feel worse. And especially you can't kick people that are necessary. And in fact, I'll actually tie this into the very beginning part of this episode because believe it or not I actually think Maui in his own fucked up simple way that simple coming at you over the Nafani Shiro thing was actually an example of simple showing growth because by the way simple literally was the guy who removed fucking Blade from Steam Friends and was like this guy is noob I will not play meanwhile like I've told people I think Blade is one of the greatest thinkers like, in the history of Counter Strike so the simple himself is a guy who didn't get the idea of like but you aren't fragging them why not shoot them in the head like he didn't get that, like, you could have people who did different roles. And so, in a weird way, I actually think him trying to defend Nafani in that case, Maui, was him trying to almost make up for that by being like, hey, but Gambit was great online and they were beating me, so, you know, respect the players even if you don't know what they do. In a weird way, I think he was actually trying to show the growth we're asking Esperanto to make, mate. What do you think? It's the fact, I mean, Simple's growth, too. There's got to be some of it, obviously. Of course, yeah, like. it's been that many years, right? Come on. Everyone's got to improve yeah. a little bit, surely. I, I, I would do a joke you, and say yeah. upgrade in German, but I don't even remember the words. Like, I'll bazing or something. I don't know. <laughs> know. Yeah. I mean, he showed some greater perspective, I think, in Reflections with you. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, as well, don't worry. This is where, once you've put enough years in this industry, you can be a bit indulgent. Because let's be real, the ending of that interview where I just like straight force him to like apologize to me is actually gangster. <laughs> fuck. Like, that is top keck. You've got to say, like, because it's entertaining as fuck. I bet the second I even asked that question, guys, everyone was like, Bloody hell, what's he going to say? Like, then it's okay. I, what you guys don't know, this is actually why I also started the episode like this, is people off camera are never like they are on Twitter, guys. Like, everyone's just chilling real life. Like, the biggest joke of all time, I've told this before, is you wouldn't believe how many events, guys, I have flamed on Twitter, the Brazilian players. And then it's just like me falling in taco, having like a beer in the bar afterwards and talking about like all the other teams and that, like... Uh, this is WWE, guys. It's not real. Half this stuff's not real. It's just, it's just entertainment, innit? Just entertainment. Yeah. Uh, I could get into my good. Yeah, now, let's though. do it. Let's, let's, let's do, do it. it. Yeah, um, mine is uh, the fact that the the maverick of the North American space, one of the longest standing uh, just esports founders, it, Jason Lake, has bought back complexity. So I'm really happy about this. I, I think that the biggest thing, the biggest issue, is that with GameSquare potentially having both complexity and phase flying sure. under their banner it obviously would have led to a conflict of interest which i don't know if even this team cares about conflicts of interest anymore but you know it still needs to be stated that that would have been the case and maybe would have led to some some drama if they were to play in the same tournament but sure it's obviously nice knowing that the brand in complexity won't have to dissolve and the team won't have to dissolve due to the fact that Jason Lake has acquired them and it's for for the details there. $10.36 million is going to be paid over three years. And some people might not really care about this too much because they probably think, well, like if GameSquare got got them, like, I don't, I don't know. I sometimes see these like kind of like weird fringe comments on the internet and may, and some people are gonna like, no one ever said that. But it's like, no, like I'm bringing it up because I have seen this. Like people will say like, oh, who even cares? Like FaZe is the better team. And you know, if they're not, if complexity is not went playing for championships, who really cares? It's like, no, the growth and health of the scene is all spurred on by the fact that there are these other teams 
as opposed to just the championship caliber rosters. And Complexity obviously haven't done as well lately after they seemingly had a nice honeymoon at the beginning of CS2 where they did very yeah. well at the Fall Finals, did very well at uh, IEM Sydney where they came in second place, almost beating FaZe out, by the way. But um, I'm glad to just see that this, is, this <coughs> roster is not going to fall apart because... By and large, they are the best North American team, and I'm including Liquid in that. So, I mean, right if, now, yeah. if, any, <laughs> if anybody's if anybody's even rooting for uh, an NA majority team, they are by far the best team because Liquid isn't even a majority team at that. Yeah. And so, for complexity, I'm I'm just glad to know that they're in good hands. I'm glad to know that it's Jason Lake that's behind them because I think over the years there's been. A little bit of, of negativity. There's the only negativity I ever saw with Jason Lake was kind of like early sticker money, which wasn't in contracts. And so it seemed like the org was taking a little bit more back than some of the players thought was fair. But beyond that, it's been a pretty clean slate for this roster or for this team overall, for this organization. And everybody that's played under Jason Lake lately seems to have great relationships with him. I'm talking about people like Config, people like like Blame F, people that, you know, have come and gone with complexity. And it just seems like Jason Lake has done what it takes, and he's been in the scene long enough to... We, we know this dude isn't just some grifter that's just oh, coming sure. in, trying yes. to score a buck, and just trying to leave. Like He's ba he's de dedicated everything in his life towards this, and I'm glad to see that he's got his baby back. What do you think of this move, Donna? I think also um, it's a great move. I was even thinking of um, using this also as my, my good point, but I assumed that one of you would mention it. And uh, yeah, I think it's very good. Uh, as also Maori said, Jason, like he's like not just like someone who is trying to make, I don't know, like uh, fast money. Or, okay, let's uh, buy this team and hope they make it to the next major. So <laughs> uh, I can live with the sticker money. Um, he's been in the scene for many, many years. He has like a great name, and also his, his face is like very um, like a lot of people know his face because sure. there's like many teams where the like owners or CEOs are more like, more like in the background. Yes, but. Um, He's like one of this like people that is like really like in in the front. I I remember like seeing him also often at events. Yeah, yeah. He was always at the LAN events, at the big events, cheering for his team, appearing, networking with people. <coughs> so you can see this is someone who is not just like uh who is just like not owning company, but he's part of esports. And I'm also glad that he's the one who's buying Complexity back. I think he sold sold them 2017 or 18. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And But I think also the lineup was not really doing well back then. Um, so kind of understandable. And uh, with him buying it back, I just like hope it, um, you know, it, it brings like a bit of a new wind uh, into the team. And also like something that we always had a very good point that they have been kind of like really, they had a good start. Like I would say in the beginning of CS2 and now like kind of like falling off. So I don't know. I just like hope that there's like also some things happening in the background, motivating the team more. And yeah, of course, uh, resolving also the conflict of interest is like the number one sure. thing, I think. Yeah. Yes, I will say it. First of all, Maui, in, in, I know you have somewhat changed your position, but if you were ever going to be the person like, what does conflict of interest and specific pedantic rules matter? You're in the wrong fucking call for that today, homie. You've got foreign <laughs> and a German. So like, listen, rules are rules, are rules <laughs> Maui. Follow the fucking rules. You, 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 exactly, enough said. But I would just say this. I actually think normally I wouldn't give a fuck about an owner buying a team. So who cares, right? But as you say, Donna, this is a rare example of somebody who's iconic. Like Jason Lake is Counter-Strike as far as I'm concerned, especially in North America. American Counter Strike. Like, not only is he the part of the reason why, like that whole region grew up and got legit, and actually he was one of the first people to properly sponsor a team. But I'll give a little bit of a history here. People won't know this. That old school team that people remember with Warden and Fraud and Storm and Volkit and that fucking fucking Sunman and uh, Trip. That lineup, that was the classic one that won ESWC. Right? They didn't have massive sponsorship like Team 3D, who had like Torbal and they had all the business connections at the time. Jason Lake, even actually, maybe this was naivety at the time. He was actually thinking, well, I won't take the small early sponsorship deals that you do to get your org going. I'll just pay it myself. And then once we hit the top, as they did, I'll then leverage it into big sponsorships. Now, that ended up not happening because obviously CGS came along. So here's a little history lesson for people. First of all, before CGS, Jason Lake had paid, as far as I know, nearly all the costs of this team. So he paid their salary, boot camps, flights, everything. And back in the day, by the way, Team Orgs didn't take all the prize money even back then. They take like a percent, but you'll never make, you'll never make a profit. 
And so as far as I know, this is a detail a lot of people aren't aware of, he put so much money in that was basically his entire life savings and nest egg that he'd done working as a fucking lawyer, one of the most boring jobs in the world. Like He basically earned like hundreds of thousands of dollars, then put it all into this team. And so then, this is what people don't know. Then when CGS came along, famously, if you ever go back, there are interviews with him where he doesn't just say like, I hope it succeeds. He basically says like, this has to succeed or esports is over because he's a guy who's just put like his whole life savings in guys. He hasn't got anything out of it at this point. So actually at the time, selling the team to CGS seemed like maybe this is it. Maybe we're going to make it. And then if people don't know, when CGS failed, he's one of the people that took it the hardest because he just essentially put his whole life and all that hard work in his real life job into this org. And he thought, oh, it's, it's the whole thing's dead. And now there's not even like a chance for it to succeed. If, if it died on TV, what future does it have? So the idea that years later, he still even got to be involved and get complexity back and have built it back up slowly. As Maui's saying, when he first came along in CSGO, they weren't even close to a top, top org. Like, they were just an NA org, and the whole thing is they could only get NA players. Like, there was never, no big name player was going to this org. So, also, when he then sold to the Dallas Cowboys, I think a lot of people don't understand that story, because they still acted like he owned the team, but also had sold it. And it's like, as far as I know, I think he'd actually cashed out most of his equity at that point. So, I think he was just running the team, essentially, for the Dallas Cowboys. Like, so, at that point, I think it's cool that this guy, essentially, after all this, we're talking about like 20 years or almost, at the end, he gets to own it again. He gets to get his original brand, Complexity, that he began 20 years ago, that he established, took through all these different eras, through CS 1.6, and CS Source, and the CS Go, CS 2 now even, as we say, he almost won the first CS 2 tournament. I think it's cool that someone like that gets to own it, because as you say, this is how you know this guy isn't a grifter. Because he's got what you call skin in the game. He literally put his life and his life savings into this fucking video game. And notice he never ever did it, guys, on some cynical, like, I'll, like pretty soon, I won't name names, but he never just went, oh, is NA shit now? I'll just sign a whole Russian roster or Brazilian roster. It was always NA lineups. You notice yeah. that? It's always majority NA because this guy also, a bit like Tabson in the German scene, is there to make his country succeed. He's not. He doesn't want to just have a good team. He wants a good North American team because he is North American and he wants to cheer for people from his region. I think that's cool. I also think when people are willing to put themselves in like that, you've got to give them extra credit. Like That's not a cynical movie. That, that's actually somebody who's a true believer, guys. I think that's dope. I think that's really cool. And then I'll just say briefly, the other thing is this. Normally, I would say, though, but who gives a fuck about complexity? But quite frankly, ever since they got a leash and now JT got better, I do care about complexity. In fact, I think the joke is they are, in my opinion, one star move from actually being really good. Like, I think if they could get... The joke is if they could get an Esperanto or some like... Tele, or they could have a Brawland type plate, that's all they'd need. They'd be like right to the top, I think. So I also think they're quite spicy. And then one last thing to say, Maui, just a little piece of advice for you, because it goes like this. And you'll know this if you've been on the internet long enough. When people say that line, when they go, huh, nobody's even saying that. I'll tell you why you never humour that comment, Maui. Because if you were to show them someone saying it, here's what they then say. Yeah, but that's just one guy. And then you go, no, no, but it isn't though. They said it on Reddit, it was upvoted. Yeah, but it's only 48 upvotes. And then what you learn eventually is they will move <laughs> yeah. the goalposts forever. And essentially what they mean is this, Maui. One of two things. Either one, I don't like that opinion, so don't say it. Or the other thing is, but I didn't say that. It's like, what you, sadly on that one, you realize like if you take them at face value, unlike what I did when I replied to Donna, you'll get nowhere, mate. They'll speak like just wasting your time. That's just the ultimate reply guy move, that one, I think. Facts. I love yeah, it. Yeah, that's facts. And they'll also Actually, throw this out there. You I, know, when they go, yeah. you're just replying to one guy. It's like, bro, you're literally triggered by one British guy who's 40 with a fucking ginger beard, you daft cunt. Like, will you just calm down? We're all, we're all getting triggered by people on the internet. I am 40, but it's true. I'm almost 40. No, yeah, but I see so. it every time. That oh, they always say that, of course. No, what's brilliant about me, Donna, is I've got to actually track my life and I'll never forget my age because they just started out like, you're 35, you're 36, you're 30. And then they just eventually say, oh, cool. So, so right, guys, my birthday is next week. Hit me up. Let me know that I'm 41. Now, do not say I'm 40. I'm 41 year old man. <laughs> Yeah. The one thing, uh, one thing I want to bring up uh, also, because I was, I actually in in December when I was actually in Abu Dhabi for the Blast World Finals, I caught Jason Lake just in the hallway randomly, and it was surprising to obviously see him there. But he would that was when he was trying to find the external funding to try to right. buy back complexity from Phase, right. and he had told me earlier that week he was. Actually, he said, this is the second time I've been Abu Dhabi in this week. And I said, okay, what's in between? And he said he was actually back in Dallas because he had a, he gave his uh, his wife some tickets to some kind of show and okay. he wanted to be, be be there with her for that. So he actually went to Abu Dhabi, flew back to Dallas, then flew back to to uh, Abu Dhabi again and was probably going to fly back to Dallas after that. And he was so literally, literally flying across and back from the world to be, one, uh, a stand-up businessman and, two, a good husband, which I, I found really impressive. <laughs> Beyond that, though, people were wondering 
wondering like what the investor group is. He he didn't really say it specifically, but Jason Lake on Twitter did did mention the fact that just to be transparent and this is quoting him, the investor group is currently me and my lifelong best friend. I kind of assume based off of that, he's actually saying he invested back into complexity with his wife. So that that that's oh, what it sounds same, like to me. Right, right. And and so there's right. not really to what to, from the sound of what he just said there, there's no greater investor group. He's just buying it back with his family again. And so once again, he's not just taking money from outside sources to try to make this thing work. And this is a huge acquisition, by the way, like 10.3 million dollars, oh, and he's insane. buying it with him and his wife again. Like like he's putting everything yeah. into it once again. And by the way, shout out to his wife, because that story I told earlier, if I just heard that my husband, remember, she doesn't follow video games. If I heard my husband just sunk all of our life savings into a video <laughs> game team, got, I might just be like, you know what? Maybe it's time for a new husband. So fair play to her also. <laughs> she also stuck around 20 years and got fucking yeah. got to win in the end. That's cool. That's actually cool. And also, by the way, for real, I actually would love it if people like that were the ones who actually became millionaires because of esports. Those are the people who deserve it. They actually yeah. were lifers. They put their whole life. They'd be in this game if they, if we were all making 10K a year instead of 100K. Like, that's impressive to me when people just care about a hobby and they really put their life and energy into it. Right. Here's what's good. My good point is a pretty simple, open-ended one, but I have a reason why I've done it. It's not as simple as it sounds. So what I put is I've just put Donk is going to the major, but the stakes are higher than that, guys, because here's the cool thing about the Donk story. Even though, yes, everyone has completely gone overboard on it, and they have literally, after one land, he is the GOAT and, like, the best player ever and all that, right? Even though I get it, I don't totally blame fans if they do that because it is such an exceptional, like, rookie campaign, especially a massive tournament like Cadavita. Like, I told people, it's not before that I like feel silly that I was like wrong that he didn't eventually collapse in the playoffs like because everyone else ever in history did even Zewu, even Simple even Deva they all did they all did guys everyone it's like I said about that Matrix jump in the first movie everyone dies on the first jump you know just so the fact this guy didn't is super hype isn't it well the cooler thing then is his second really big land is going to be the fucking major guys the first okay. major of the game all I'm going to say is this he doesn't even have to win it but imagine if he actually carries it this major if that happens, then, by the way, then you have my permission to get fully hyped and to go to the absolute limits of the earth. Because well, even though people are going to say, Maui, but that's hypocritical. With Zewu, you said everyone should calm down. That's because Zewu himself was human. Like, if you remember those first ones, like, he would have playoff games where he just, you know, he'd have one map that wasn't that great. The Donk guy might be the only rookie ever that could just be the best player, like, from day one. So I just think it's cool he's going to get the chance to potentially show us immediately. Because here's the thing. If he really carries the majors, his, like, second massive land, you can't say anything at that point in time. He's just... He's just just is the fucking best, right? <laughs> what do you think, Donna? Um, so I I think also um, what I what I really want to point out first of all is that um, the community is just like so fast to jump on the oh yeah he's washed train. Oh, of course. Because I remember after Kat <laughs> first of all in Katowice everyone was hyping him up, so we had like okay it was kind of divided. We had the people who were just like saying Donk is crazy. I was one of them, and then we had people who were saying. Um, yeah, guys, uh, he's just fluking a life, life event, whatever. And then you have the game, right. uh, the people who are saying, oh, yeah, he's probably cheating, you know, like. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as he had a bad map, I remember it was the first time we saw him playing on Vertigo at, um, <clears throat> at what is it? Armar, Armar, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. I think the threats and Twitter comments and, ev and chat comments, <laughs> everything about uh, Doug got figured out. Doug washed at 17 years old. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> After, like, two maps or something, right? <laughs> like, the, yeah, like, the people who were, like, preying on his downfall for, like, having a bad map. Holy shit. But this just shows you how good he was and how he was, like, like just, like, stomping this whole event. He was, like, putting players that had years of years of experience in his place and uh, just like literally carried spirit. Uh, not saying, by the way, the spirit uh, didn't participate no, no, at all sure. because the team is making him shine, of course, as well. Um, but just like the fact that you're like 17, you're going in, on the stage, you, you're playing in Spodek, one of the like most uh, prestigious, legendary arenas in, in CS Esport. And he just like went and picked up his trophy, being the MVP, having a 1 7 rating, just crazy, crazy, crazy. And honestly, I think also in the RMR, he played well. He had maybe a few, like, two or three bad maps, uh, but it happens, you know. It's also, like, the thing uh, that, of course, like, teams will, like, uh, try to um, anticipate him more and try to counter him more. Um, he's not uh, invincible. And, um, yeah, it's just, like, 
I don't know, I'm just like so impressed with him. And I think as soon as um, Le- uh, Spirit is going to go into the playoffs, and I'm very confident that they're going to make it to the playoffs, we're going to see the Katowice donk. I have a very strong feeling about it. Thoughts, Maui? I, I, I mean, I hope that he's able to maintain some kind of form. I do feel like people are now keying into onto his tendencies, and that's why, for example, people are trying to pick Vertigo as much as they can against him. <laughs> But uh, I, I think that... Uh, I love the idea of have... one single instance of... Like, we got him figured out, lads. We got him at last. <laughs> Vertigo yeah. all day long. Like, that's... I love it. I fucking love it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also think it's really funny that Donna recognizes these, like, totally micro reactions that happen in the span of, like, eight hours. And then people kind of forget about them. Because honestly, I mean, it's fun. It's, it is funny. Like, I, I don't... I mean, people do just have completely reactionary and overblown takes every oh, time gosh. something good or bad happens on the internet. Now, that's kind of what... That's kind of what you need to do to like just just make your name heard or your voice heard a little bit is you just say the most outlandish thing ever. I expect that Donk is still going to do very well. I don't I do want to remind people that even though Zaiwu hit the ground running when he got to uh, Dreamhack, like his first kind of se- serious land was a Dreamhack open Atlanta and he won the MVP. He kind of like blew everybody out of the water at it. But at his following major, which was Katowice, he had a much more pedestrian rating. It wasn't like it wasn't. It wasn't bad. He was 1.14, but he was like tied with Apex for rating on his team, for example. Like it was in and they finished outside of the playoffs. So like I feel like I don't I, I feel like Spirit overall as a team is a bit better than Vitality was back then, though. So I feel like they're probably I think the likelihood that they make playoffs is much higher. But <laughs> this is going to be a really cool test because I, I feel like with Donks coming out party for Katowice, well, now the sky's the limit because he already broke one record there for yeah. debut LAN. And if he's able to have an even like a similarly high performing major, well, how how far can this guy go? And again, it's, it's he's doing it as a rifler in, yes. in an age where it just feels like everything's dominated by offers. So overall, good point being Donk making it to the major. Yeah, thank God, because if, if he weren't and we were just kind of left like. It, it kind of felt would have felt like how Monacy didn't qualify to to yeah. Rio with with G two, oh, yeah. and everybody just felt like, well, that's one major narrative that we're now missing from sure. this tournament, and why it felt like the playoffs. Who knows? Could G two have done better at that one? We don't we don't know. And frankly, they never gave themselves a chance. But yeah, I I, I hate seeing for, personally. I just hate seeing narratives drop off a cliff. I'm kind of like, I guess I'm I'm a narrative stan where I just I don't really. I obviously like the best Counter Strike in the world, but I like to see continuity because I don't like thinking that this game is just completely random and that sure. one day pe- teams are good and the next day that they're bad. <laughs> like I, I hate that the most. I hate that more than anything, actually. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Also, I have to say, um, <clears throat> just like not related to Donk or Spirit, but I kind of had this uh, f- uh, this feeling at the Paris Major where you had like uh, like teams like I don't know ITB for example making it to the playoffs. Gamer Legion being in the finals, I feel like if you think about it, this would be not imaginable. Sure. You know, having these teams at the playoffs, they didn't even make it now to the major. No offense, of course, uh, here, but you know, if you're like really just neutral and objective, um, like it's it feel it felt kind of like random, you know. And yes. this is also where I have to say it's true. Like it's uh, it can always be good if someone has a great event or if a team is like you know popping off somehow, but it's all about co- consistency in the end, right? By the way, also, I will just point out, that is the funniest part, is that you guys really did overreact to three maps of <laughs> bad play. By the way, that implies he's never, ever allowed to have a bad map. Like, what's, what actual standard are we setting here? Because all I'll tell you guys is, you didn't even wait for this RMR to finish. By the end of the RMR, he was fifth in fucking overall stats, and he had, like, a 1.24 rating. Like, spoiler, the joke is, like, Rops would take that rating tomorrow if you offered it to him. Like, if that's Don Cavan an off tournament where he's figured out well then the joke is he is the goat you idiot like he's gonna be fucking insane and spoiler when a player like that this is why i say that thing about the eye test because you know what there are players i've seen before where like the way the team played is part of why they were good or you know like for example like they have a certain map where they just they're really amazing at one angle like jiggle peeking it or something that's not what this guy's doing at all like if you watch this guy's spray there is no solution to that like it's just better than everyone else's like yeah. he's like an aimbot guy so there's no like we've solved dog you might be able to i would give the obvious analogy is like your kinda right because 
The thing is, they're not quite the same level of player. He came as a little bit more, but he came along as a phenom himself. I would say, yes, people learned how to play against Ikinda, but you can't solve a player like that because he also was using insane mechanics. Like, you can maybe, like, figure out things he likes to do, but at the end of the day, if he plays really well, it's like any sport, the better offense basically always beats better defense. Like, the, the star players are the best in the game for a reason. They can't be contained. You can maybe, like I say, you can have a game plan, but at the end of the day, you will just get donked or see yeah. will take you out and win all the clutch or simple monster. That's what, that's just the nature of CS, guys. You don't figure people out like that. There's not a fucking, there's not a counter like some Pokemon yeah. that which makes Donk rubbish <laughs> at this point, is it? It's not confused, is he? It's a, it just, you fucking, he had one, right. he had three bad maps. That's it. Three bad maps. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so Someone needs to clip Thorin saying you will get donked. I don't think I would have ever thought. I, I, don't, I didn't it's think right. you would ever say that. Listen, every now and then, listen, I told you, it's a different, we're changing the vibe on this show. I'm getting down with the kids, starting to use all the <laughs> slang of the lingo. Who knows? Yeah, maybe, sure. maybe, maybe I'll actually get a gold coin this time, just, you know, just for the youth to show them it's possible. Probably not. I'll probably get the bronze. Again. For the Zoomers. Diamond <laughs> coin for the Zoomers. Let's yes. go. Right. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to move on to the bad section. So what's funny here is, Donna, what is your bad point? The joke is, this could just be a Maui point, but okay. What is your bad point? What have you picked? Ooh. Okay. Uh, so my bad point is uh, Liquid's current struggles um, compared to what people expected them to be sure and uh yeah so i will just uh summarize what uh, like some of my points so the thing is uh when liquid when first of all there were like rumors right before they announced it oh for ages yeah Chris is going and maybe Caden is going and everyone was so hyped um i was hyped for it too i was like oh my god that that's that sounds crazy it could be insane and uh when the lineup was uh, set and then they made the huge announcement also like uh, of course twist going back to liquid um going back to his like old orc um just like so much like excitement i think for many people in the community and um yeah but i think it's always like tough because if you like overhype a new lineup like this i feel always it's like so close that you know it, it there might be like too much pressure and then uh, they might be underwhelming um i still think liquid has all the pieces to be a top team 100 percent um, but they had like a very um, shaky, slow start. They didn't play that well at the last spring finals where you could say, okay, it was like the first event, right? There's still a new team. They need to figure things out. They need to vibe with each other, you know, like see, figure it, each other out, who plays how. Um, it is in the end of team game. So this is, I think, understandable. <coughs> and then after that, I think what was like really unfortunate for them is that they missed out IEM Katowice. It was because of the ESL ranking. So they didn't get the invite. Um, I think this was like a really like um, put them like really set them back, you know, and uh, then they just since then they just played NA qualifiers, open qualifiers. And I have to say, um, I don't know, maybe it's like the online environment playing against an A teams teams that uh, most of the players didn't really play against. So you could say like, OK, you know, it was like a different environment. It is online. It's always different online, but still the performance so far was a bit underwhelming. And um, I have to say also in some i would say twist was very like good enough it's very consistent um but kadian i think is uh performing not uh, as you used to do in heroic and yekin are also um very underwhelming com consider that he was like also one of the upcoming star riflers sure. and um thinking now okay he's like not igling like he has like an igl now uh, experience igl he should like you know blossom again um, I don't see it yet. Um, I think we will get to this point. You don't just like lose your talent. You just don't lose the mechanical skill. But you can see that there's like just like some things going on where it's not clicking yet. And um, well, I hope it's going to happen very soon because they're playing right now the RMR. Um, they're one lose away to be eliminated. They can still, of course, qualify in the next game. But I think no one expected Liquid to kind of like struggle. I think a lot of people expected them to go easy through it, you know? Uh, the, the liquid pains as I've kept my eye on them have kind of come from a couple different angles. Uh, so kind of like when we talked about Astralis, I think on the last podcast, just like, I couldn't, I can't really blame an individual player. Um, if you want to say who's underperforming the most per role, I <coughs> think it has to be Yakindar actually. Yeah. I think yeah. it, but in terms of actual strategy, I feel like. The calling has not been as clean. I feel like I expected Liquid to play with this style that resembled a lot more like heroic, <clears throat> but I feel like that's not necessarily happen happening all the time. Like they're they're still 
they're still kind of going for these like mid round sort of ideas that I remember heroic doing. But I would I will say that the trading isn't quite as good as I remember heroic being. That being said, I mean heroic was a team that was obviously built off the fact that they played for a long time together. They were yeah. all speaking in a native language, and then they were able to uh, have incredible synergy that lifted them above the some of their parts. I think that this liquid team is. Uh, pretty much verifiably playing beneath the sum of their parts. You would you would expect them to be better if they have this sort of talent on the roster. And I I mean, you named practically everybody on the team. I think the one guy that I still have questions about is is actually still Skulls. Like I I feel like I've I've seen some good stuff from him. I think C T to me he kind of reads as a CT side merchant for me. I feel like he's been very good on the defensive side. Scrawny's had yeah. a couple tweets about it, but when I see him play uh, alongside Twists on a couple different bomb sites, feels like their synergy is good. They tether off each other pretty well. But then on T side, I've seen this guy. I mean, against that in that Furia game that he played yesterday, that guy. I mean, he had zero impact. In fact, he was kind of like detrimental to them because he was dying in ways that he shouldn't be, especially in mid late round situations. And also, he just doesn't have nearly the same impact that he did on Pain, where they let him just kind of off the off the loot, off the leash. Like he got to do a lot of his own sort of lurking based off of his own feelings. But now that he has to play in a system that's a little bit more structured, it feels yeah. like Skulls is just kind of confining himself, and he doesn't know when he can take certain risks, when he can't. And I I, I kind of want to just like snap everybody back to reality for the the career of Skulls. Like this guy has never really been insane versus top opposition. Like he, he's not really like like he. He's, he's been a solid piece and on pain he looked like he was pretty good at some of the events that he played but like <clears throat> even he just smurfed against Brazilian competition so regularly that that his rating always looks so good but when you actually look at like last six months versus top 50 opponents 20 maps 0.98 rating like he's not just smurfing against anybody in the world in fact when he when he starts playing really high opposition he drops off a cliff pretty massively so I don't really I don't know if this was necessarily the pick for them. I obviously know that they would have wanted K Serato instead. And I think that that team would have been, been mega still because even if they had these kind of hiccups and teamwork that they're showing right now, I think K Serato would have lifted them well above and beyond what yeah. Skulls has been doing. So I, I, yeah, there's a lot to be left to be desired for, for, um, for liquid right now. I want, I want to, and the thing is, I'll just put, I'll put someone on the spot and make this a little dicier and hotter is that this to me right now is like, it's kind of reading a little bit like a nepotism move from from Zeus that he's picking up skulls in this. Like he's not it, he's not that sick. Like he's not skulls isn't that good. Like it's it's kind of crazy that they went for someone like this it, with a huge buyout by the way, like a monacy level buyout from Pain trying to get this guy, try to get him on a higher paying roster when I don't know when I've ever really seen anything that has totally merited that. Like he's okay. Like I, I he's definitely like an average he's an average pro, but for a player that's on Liquid, I want everybody to be well above average and I don't see any like Skulls Skull the praise that Skulls was getting when he came into Liquid was almost the same level of overhype that I was seeing people throw at Mezzi when he was on like Fnatic it's like okay. guys he's good like don't don't get me wrong like he's he's a solid player he's like a solid pro but like are we really going off and saying like this is the most underutilized underrated player ever it's like look at his numbers against top teams look at how he has zero impact on T sides like I, I don't get what what we're looking at here that's giving me such a different picture than what people are seeing out there Okay, it's pretty strong there. I will just say this. I'll pick up on the last thing you said there, right? I know what you mean. If you look at like the buyout and how difficult it was to get this player, I agree on that sense. It's a massive gamble, a massive one, because as you're saying, he isn't modesty. But the key thing for me is this. I don't want to hear anyone North American talk shit on Skulls because look at the rest of the lineup. The joke is every other player can be a HLTV top 20 player. Like, he doesn't have to be some fucking star. I agree, for the money, you probably should be. Yeah. It's like when JKS was on Complexity. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're okay. If you know you get a guy gets like 40k a month, you're going to say, you better play like a 40k a month player. Like, mm. you better be the star player. I get that angle. But here's the thing. I'm actually not worried about this team. I know that's probably going to shock people. because of, Although I'm obviously biased because I'm a friend of Zeus. But here's why. Because actually, if you look at the lineup, first of all, this lineup realistically doesn't have any history together. Like, even... Even though, like, Yakindar and Naf were on Liquid together, like, the joke is, they just spent the time with Yakindar's and IGL. Like, when they played together before that, that was with Nitro's IGL. So as far as I'm concerned, there's almost nothing there. Luckily, they played different roles. Then you have Twists, but Twists wasn't there when Yakindar was there. So he's not part of that squad. He maybe knows Naf, but that was from years ago. And I'd say yeah. Twists is even a different player. Cadian's obviously, like you said, only played with, like, basically, like, the heroic team as, a, as like, an elite IGL and Orpus. So it's a very different environment. And then Skulls is coming to the Brazilian team. So actually, this should, on paper, 
paper be an incredibly big and ambitious project. Like, this is not an easy project. This, this reminds me of when Na'Vi made their team. Like, they were taking all these totally different players and trying to blend them all together, except in this yeah. case, I'd say it's even harder, potentially. They don't even have, like, the existing people. So I'm going to give this team way more time than just one or two lands. I agree with what Donna said. One of the big problems they've had at the moment is they haven't even given themselves the chance because they failed, like, the blast. They failed the online qualifiers. So it's a, it's a bummer that basically, if they it would be a big deal if they didn't make the major, just because they wouldn't have any tournaments for months and months. That's the really scary thing. But I actually think if you look at the quality of the names that they have, I think it's still a really interesting lineup. And actually, to tie to what you said, Maui, in a weird way, this might sound counterintuitive, but the positive side for me is that they actually all do frag on CT side. That actually implies the skill is there. They, like These players aren't fake and frauds, but the T side is obviously a nightmare right now. The good news there is you do have KD and you do have Zeus. These are people I trust that can fix problems and adapt and figure out what to do. And actually, in this team, quite frankly, KD doesn't look like actually, you know what, for all the shit we gave him now about being the main character, it doesn't look like he's trying to do that at all in this team. It looks like in this team, he understands he's got all these mega all our players and he's absolutely taken that back seat and I imagine he's probably going to be a not very high fragging IGL guys I don't think that's even on the table at this point in time but that's fine again if I look at people like your twists, your kinder, naf mate. If you can just get those guys rolling, this team could be really good, in my opinion. Yeah. So I agree. The, core, the early results are a bit worrying, and especially not making tournaments that can just kill your team dead anyway because you have to be at the events. But if they can just get to the major, I actually think it's all okay. It's actually why I did that tweet if people saw where I said I don't really care like what score you win by. Like you know what people are like you only won 13 11 against bestie. Who cares if I get to the major? It's in like a month, and I've got loads of time for things to be different. Like it's not like that match is going to somehow stop me winning a match that gets yeah. into the playoffs so I don't mind about that just survive is all I care about so as long as they get through his armor I'll still give him a bit more time I'm not going to I'm not going to pull the, the panic switch just yet absolutely and I also sorry. go on go on jump in no, go for it go yeah. for it I, I also think um, as I said before like they have all the pieces to be a top team 100% um, okay. I think they had like a, a, a unlucky uh, shaky start but I sure. think making the major uh, this is like so huge for them if they make the major I also think it's just gonna go like uh, gonna be better you know but uh, it's just like still like you know scary to see that they're struggling a bit right now and not making the major this would be I think a huge uh, problem um, also just like to I want to answer to Maui's point before yeah, go on. Skulls. Um, he might of course case Serato, if you compare them like is the better player uh, probably in many aspects, but I don't really think you need someone like Kei Serato if you have enough twists uh, and Yekinder on the team, especially if Yekinder is activated as well. As I said before, Naf and Twist, I think they have been doing their job. Um, Yekinder, he has he has it, right? He just needs to find it a bit uh, again and get his form back. And I think you have these three players and then you have like uh, Kaden Experience IGL. You don't need the best uh, player. Like I think someone like Skulls, who is a bit like more like on the supportive side, um, is is like more than enough, and um, I also think that he probably just needs a bit of time to adjust because um, he doesn't have the same experience as the other players. So I kind of like don't want to be too harsh on him because he's the one with the least experience, probably like especially playing against sure. big teams, you know. By the way, on the Yakinda thing, even though obviously I banged on him the whole time he went IGL because he did talk shit on me. So yeah. that's why I'll always give you it a hundred <laughs> times worse. But that was just as IGL, guys. I do think the re my point about that was I just thought he had too much hubris thinking he could do the role. He is a mega skilled player. Like, spoiler, even everyone watching those two maps where he did bad. By the way, he already, he already leveled up already. Don't worry about that. But even those two maps that look terrible... The joke is, I'd take this guy tomorrow on like an RV or something like that. We talk about his skill levels, fucking mega. Like, you don't throw a player like this away. So I'm not even worried about that one. Even though, yeah, he was a bit of a dick to me. He is a good player. Don't worry about that. And also, <laughs> this is why actually, Maui, it turns out this show was a lot more civil than I realized. Because on this show, Donna's all polite. She's like, yeah, if I could just say something. But on Twitter, she comes in like, now then, Maui Snake, I know you don't know much about this Counter Strike, but let me teach you how European teams work. <laughs> <laughs> It's just yeah, heat at yeah. the moment. I'm actually not. Nice. Right. <laughs> right. okay. It's okay. It's all right. We all do hot takes. It's all good. Right. What about then? Now we're going to go to Maui's bad point, which is a bit similar, but you can work some other angle it's, on it. Maui, what's your bad point? It's it's a broader broader view, and it barely even includes liquid in this. It, but it, it, I mean, I, I did for the sake of this stat that I had ready to go is that while watching, like, I just said on the last hot take point made episode that Brazilian CS is in the worst state that it's been for eight years 
and North American CS goes and does this. Like the the head to head matchups between like South American CS and North American CS has been pretty abysmal when it comes to the record right now. It, in terms of what I what I've kept up to as the, as of the time of this recording, it's four to eight. It's four to eight, and I'm actually including. Um, I'm like actually, actually, if you don't want to include Liquid in this, it would just be three to seven. It would be three to seven okay. for North American teams versus South American teams. And if I thought that the state of Brazilian CS was bad, I think we've just had our blinders on this whole time in in bias bias in a bias land where we're just praying to ourselves, twiddling our thumbs, saying, "Oh, look, M80 looked pretty good. They're beating all of the other North American competition. Well, they can't even really beat um, them, and, and all these other North American teams can't beat even these like tier three Brazilian teams. Like that, it's getting." It's gotten to a point where I look at, I, I don't know what the bright spots necessarily are because you used to, the, the mega cope was like, was like, oh, but like, but like the individual talent is there. It's that the calling's bad. Sure. I've seen some calls sure. look pretty good and they were surrounding these, these teams, especially like on these like, like Inferno crunches because it seems like Inferno keeps coming up in these maps and these NA teams just can't hit their shots. They can't trade. That's not, that's not a calling thing. That's an individual skill thing. And so what used to be the easy cope was like, well, I know that these these guys can hit nasty headshots. I can't even cope like that anymore. I don't know where to go anymore to try to lift up my own spirits when I watch some of these games because they're losing to these teams in such a such abysmal way. So I think that when it comes to NA right now, I'm just incredibly concerned. And like some of the rising talents just didn't show themselves here. Like people were hyping. I, I was kind of interested in this one guy. He had two articles written about him, one on Dust2 US, one on HLTV. This Jaba guy on Wildcard. I mean, he did nothing, unfortunately, to get me excited about him and that team. And uh, when I think about some of the other teams, like even I wanted Elevate, I wanted I wanted Elevate to do a little bit decently because it's like, oh, they're the bad boys in North America right now. Like they obviously have this really uh, kind of toxic history where they just talk shit in pugs all the time. And then they went out 0-2, uh, losing to to Cold Zera or like to to like, to Otic actually, not not even uh, Cold Zera team, like a, a team with Woody and Turtle and three guys that I've never heard of. And then Nouns, uh, another team which is like they're kind of always fighting for that second or third best spot, depending if you count Liquid as a North American team. Like it's either them or M80 are supposed to be the second best team in. North America majority lineups and then they go out 0-2 losing to Cold Zera's legacy like this is just man it's just it was just super disappointing these first couple days and there's just no other chances you I mean with these teams they're out like you go 0-2 in this stuff you're out so I'm um, I'm overall really disappointed with with NA right now I I believed very certainly that Nouns was going to take down that that legacy team okay. and I was really really like that's probably why I'm so hung up on this I don't want to just blame Nouns as a whole. I'm blaming some of the other teams too, because it's like NRG <laughs> went out 0-2 also, and they didn't look competitive in their games either. And even even some of these other other rosters, like um, I mean, basically, yeah, it's just it's just been super disappointing. And I thought NA was on the uptick. Well, if I have to just look at the results and read read with the truth right now, it's it's right there. And NA is not actually back. By the way, Donna, it's up to you what you want to say on this one. If you actually don't give a fuck about North American bum-ass teams, th that's fine too. Do you have any takes on this? Um, I mean, I don't care so much about North American teams, to be honest. I follow the EU scene more. Um, but I have to say that for me, the Brazilian scene, like the South American scene in general, looks like they just like are bringing up way more talents, um, have like a bigger talent pool. And I don't know, it's like just like... For example, I would have not expected like a team like Boss. It's just like a not saying that they're bad or something, but it feels like like they're like a mix of like you haven't heard from most of them ever, and they made it to the RMR, and I'm like, okay, like who is where, who is where, where is the competition? You know what I mean? And then uh, like you have like also Complexity who looked so good. I mean, they made it to the finals of I Am Sydney, or was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like looking super promising, and now they're kind of like in the slump, and I just like hope that these teams like you know get back to the top or like you know like uh, i don't know like stepping up a bit and that you get like more talent but in general like i feel like it's just like a very thin talent pool in the in a scene and actually there was something i streamed today uh the match uh, liquid against uh, boss um on twitch and there were like some viewers who asked me if i think that it's fair that uh, there's an NA and South American qualifier separately because South America has so much, uh, so many better teams or so many more talents. 
and they think it is unfair that uh, they're having both separate qualifiers sure. because more Brazilian teams or South American teams uh, deserve uh, the spot at the RMR. And that was actually kind of like a fair point. I could not really like uh, talk about it so much because I was watching the match. Um, but just like to bring it up that, you know, the community is noticing it too and sure. asking themselves, like, uh, do they deserve uh, a non-qualifier and uh, that many spots at the RMR, you know, considering how the level is right now? Yes, indeed. No, here's the thing. Like I say, you always have permission on this show to just care about what you care about. Like, spoiler, I didn't give a fuck about watching OG when Nexa was on him. Just a fucking garbage lineup when it was going nowhere. So it's all good. You know, we, we're all into different things. That's all good. We all like I'm not going to comment this. <laughs> It's all good. It's all... What people don't know, by the way, is I actually know Nexa. And he's one of those people where even if I flim as a player, I actually know this person privately. So it's all good. Don't worry about that. It's all cool. And also, by the way, he's actually a super legit guy. He's actually one of the few players who never gets bothered by that shit and never lashes out. And actually, just... no, He's actually the sort of person, by the way, if you're an analyst, you could message this guy and he'll just tell you what he thinks or what was going on at the team. He'll actually yeah. give you the behind-the-scenes info, which not that many pros will do, but it's cool when they do it. So props in that sense. No, on this whole topic of like the RMR, the big problem obviously is that like the NA teams I've noticed one of their problems is I almost wonder if it's like where they play because I feel like Maui these NA teams always look way better against <coughs> European competition than against their own like domestic competition and the Brazilians even I don't know if it's like a stylistic compo would you have like even a, a theory or like a can even like come up with an angle on what why that would be because I've always felt like the joke is like complexity could actually play the best teams in the world super close but then it could also almost lose to just some random NA team that's a really that is a really good question that I can't really explain other than the fact that I'm sure they have more familiarity with each other. Sure. But I, I yeah, because honestly, you are right. Like complexity does seem to elevate their game when they're against Europeans. So I think actually, OK, the, the, the theory that sucks is just that, well, if they're playing in an N.A. or an America's type tournament, it probably means that the, the practice they had before that was in the Americas. So they don't jet lag themselves sure. flying over. And so they probably their level almost lowered before the event. I mean, but I think Complexity actually had a European boot camp. Well, Complexity is doing well. OK, Complexity is doing well. Oh, that's America's sure, RMR sure. so far. Okay. Yeah, but like other Marmar, teams. Yes. Yeah. yeah, other other times. Yeah, they've looked actually worse for wear but uh yeah that's that's my theory all i'll say is this the main thing that's making you look really bad america is if i click stats the player at the top of the stats is fucking henny who was like <laughs> hey remember he burst on the scene guys about nine years ago like what are we talking about like it's a lot that's not like an up and coming player that's like a i was it's the joke is i'm like he still fucking plays like and andy's apparently smurfing so that's what's making you look stupid america it's like you want to complain like oh these european teams have more money and option but yeah, henny's on fucking imperial bro like he's not he hasn't got any of those advantages he's still just i don't know saying what up lucas should we get in the lambo later and beat the club oh fuck i've got to finish this game i better carry the joke is <laughs> know, he I just know. carries the matches so they can get the fucking bottle service before the fucking club closes <laughs> down don't they like this yeah. guy's a fucking g so what excuse do you have because spoiler i know he isn't fucking practicing all day well i don't actually know that's a joke that's a joke that's a harmless joke people <laughs> technically he could be practicing i just imagine he doesn't I do you have to realize guys in a way low key if this was a movie and he'd be my favorite character i'd make him like some fucking swagged out guy who'd never practiced just <laughs> turned up you know and fucking bald put on his shades just went off with the fucking phantom obviously as well I've dated myself there I've even referenced like fucking designer track or whatever from about 10 years ago also but that's actually appropriate because life of Pablo was when Henny first reached his peaks but you know what that's the problem isn't it Maui it isn't life of Pablo anymore we're already onto Vultures volume 1 and volume 2 so all I'm going to say is how much of Kanye's discography has to come out before NA gets good shout out to Cold I'll still give them props fair play fair play okay right let's do it then so my bad point for this one is I'm very specifically put it this way because I want to characterize the point. It's not just Astralis. It's actually specifically the direction the team of Astralis is heading. Because if you think about it, right, we all waited months and months for this massive blockbuster move to happen of Stown and Yabby for millions of dollars. And when it was set, even though a lot of us made the point, like I'm not sure how the roles are worked. The point is when you have players that good, you think they'll just figure it out. Like, you know, you, you give them time, you give them a few tournaments. When they're that good, even if one person has to take a bit of a backseat, as long as the other shine you're gonna have a fucking amazing team you do have four top 20 players like this should be amazing right here's the problem 
Guys, we've barely had any lands and they've already lost one of the top 20 players he's benched already. And spoiler, he was the best performing one, guys. Like, So they've lost Blame F. And here's why I hate it. This is why I say the team direction. It's not a specific player I'm flaming. If anyone saw the interview when Blame F took over as IGL, this is really alarming. Dude, he made it sound like it wasn't his choice. He said something like Astralis came to him and said, like, would he be comfortable doing it? Because they were going to let Glaive go. And he was just sort of like... Yeah, okay, I'll do it. Which is, that's not what I want to hear from my IGL. My IGL, I want the guy who's like, I'll live for this game. Like, yes, give me the thing. I've got a whole idea. We're going to use this player, this player, this player. Because that's the problem. In my opinion, you've almost like set blame up to fail there. You've given him a job. You've thought, well, you've asked him, can you do this hard job that you're not currently doing? By the way, he was already a lights out fucking rifler. You know what you're saying? Can you do a harder job? And he's going, I'll give it a go. And then after like one and a half lands, you're, like, you're fired. Get on the bench. And then... Here's the problem, because we're all so hyped off that thing of like four top 20 players, it's a super team. The next name that comes in has to be a bagger. It has to literally be like, it's okay, guys, we've re-signed Glaive. It cost a million, but it's worth it. We're going to be the super team. No, no, you bring in the bro guy, already this is a red flag. The fucking team director doesn't even know who he is and thought he was on Monty, fragging <laughs> at the fucking major. Bro, Monty was in the playoffs of the major, mate. Like, do you actually watch Counter Strike? And if people don't know the punchline to that one, it's even better. At the time that Monty was doing that at the major... The guy was in Astralis talent, you fucking idiot. So he was even in Astralis Hawk and you didn't know it. So look, I get it that that guy from Heroic wasn't actually in Astralis at the time. But even him doing that, look, that could just be a mistake, obviously. But it's not a good sign. And then the second reason why that worries me, because this is the guy who's in the Hasper's fifth role, the Casper Straub guy, so he's going to be the director of the project. The reason why I'm alarmed is because if you ever read Richard Lewis's Substack article about the behind the scenes of the Yao Stabby in the Stabby, move, the Stown and Yabby move where they moved over, what Richard revealed was actually the, the trigger point wasn't those players, it was when Astralis last year in summer signed this guy, because you remember, you might remember the story when I mentioned this detail when they announced Casper Fit was leaving they announced, well, we've got the heroic guy and if you remember it initially was like, he's going to start in October, but then they figured out a deal like days later, and they're like, actually he's just starting now he's like beginning immediately, if people don't know, Richard says that that guy was sort of like the one who had the connection to Stown and that when Stown had that tragedy where his brother died this was the guy who was like his support network and his rock and he was also obviously working with more like sports psychology type stuff I believe he's actually like a, a physical therapist it's sort of like game of doc scenario as far as I know so I do notice those people tend to make it like they know everything but okay so obviously this guy had a close connection so what it was implied was the heroic players didn't know this guy was going to go to Astralis and when he did they were sort of like what the fuck that's my guy like I want to be with him so I, I'll, the reason I bring this up is because people have made this whole story like Haha, <laughs> it's good that Astral's failed because fuck's down in Yabby. But actually, if you listen to that story, it's not quite what you thought. Like, you're all thinking, oh, they were just tra traitors to Cadian and the bitch. No, it actually sounds like they actually have a, a legitimate reason to potentially want to leave the team or go to this team. But what I'm worried about is, I hope this guy actually has the goods. I hope he actually does understand Couch Strike. And this was just a, an accident with the fucking bro guy. Because at the moment, if you look at their lineup and you combine, you've benched Blame F. By the way, one thing you cannot dispute about Blame F is he's a mega consistent fucking player. Like, he puts up numbers every tournament. So what we're replacing him with is a low fragging player and then we're going to take our other most consistent player device and make him the IGL. Bro, this guy hasn't igl for one second in his life. Like, I don't even know if in a pog he's ever called a strat. Like, this is mental. Like, so even though, again, they're saying all the right things, except for fucking up who the player is and who we played for. Aside from that, they're saying all the right things. Oh, the device wants to do it. Yeah, he's really motivated at this point in his career. Look, I want to believe it all, but right now, this team, I feel like, needs simple solutions. These are more complicated solutions. Like I have the, that's why I say it. The final thing is, the bad point is just the direction. Like, the, I feel like at the beginning of the year, I was mega hyped. Like, holy fuck, the super team. Now it's like, bro, if they're even just all right now, I'll sort of just take it. You know what I mean? I feel like all the hypes is gone. It's gone immediately. Come on, then. Jump in. So, so okay. uh, yeah, you, you want to take it, Donna, or you want me to go? Um, I mean, I I wanted to say something about the whole Astralis thing. Um, also, as my ugly point, so I think I would just like throw it in here, or so we like. Oh, uh, fair enough. Okay, yeah, true. I was making more well, the direction, but yeah, we'll do I, some of the specifics there. You're going. Okay, okay. How, or, or do you wanna do you wanna just like transition to that after I make my point then? Yeah, yeah we'll I'm, just do it that way. Okay, yeah, we'll okay, okay. We don't speak that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. So this this team this team failing is. One, uh, a huge indictment on Blame F and everything like that because his call the calling was obviously not great and the synergy was pretty bad. But, like, this was... Um
But like again, like the the main point being made here is that he didn't really want to be the in game leader here, and it doesn't seem like he wants to be the in game leader moving forward either. So this is like I I felt like okay when they got rid of Blame F, I kind of was like this has to. Well, actually, the, the first thing I tweeted was that this felt like a cost saving measure for me. I felt like they were putting him on the bench because we know that Blame F gets paid an exorbitant amount of money. Like he just sure. like he's like one of the higher paid people in the space period and he was on complexity also. And so for 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 right now with what Astralis are doing and indicating, this seems like they spent way too much money to get Yabby, way too much money to get down as well. They saw a cheaper option in Bro. Oh, by the way, that, so, to, to your point as well, they're obviously not going to get a stick of money either, so they're actually going to miss potentially millions they probably ex thought they were getting. Ex exactly, exactly. They, they This lineup obviously would have stayed together. I, I would say that even if they if they bombed out of the Copenhagen major, they would have still kept this lineup to the upcoming major yes. following that. Yes. They didn't they didn't just they're they're viewing one result and they're making to me they're making a decision that's based entirely off of the future funds of the organization, which isn't necessarily like a bad no, no. move, but it but it's in, in that in that like small context. Mm -hmm. But it's a bad move that you're making an opera that's now going to have uh, is, he's going to get worse. Device is going to play worse because of this. Like, there's no doubt in my mind he is going to be a worse individual player. And you're getting a player who maybe fits a little bit better role wise. And so Yabby can go back to a couple of his other spots. But this doesn't really solve everything in terms of the calling, which would, to me was the biggest issue. Like. Yabby still played some of his T side spots and he just wasn't playing very well. He, I mean, some of the CT side spots, he definitely had to change, but those were spots he actually played before on Copenhagen flames, if I'm not mistaken. And so there's all these, like, if you had to take any player out of this roster, to me, the guy that wasn't, doing anything for his role was yabby like in terms of individual performance and so for one for one and you wouldn't have wanted to necessarily like keep blame f on the igl role but this is where you get somebody like i'm not i almost i'm almost like cringing saying his name right now but it's like kind of want to get like a selfless player like a hooksy you want to get someone that can Why just not? play these anchor spots players. yeah of course yeah, you get someone that can just just orchestrate things and play the bad roles as opposed to now shifting again the in-game leader role to a guy that, yeah, I guess I, I, you, you said, Thorin, like on sure they're saying he wants to do it, but like nobody really wants to do it. Like th that, that's not really true. Like nobody really wants to actually take up this role, like lose some of their individual performance. He does it out of necessity because if basically like if if device right now is being forced to say that he wants to be the in-game leader it's going to look so bad on him and people are going to turn on him oh, if he are. starts calling sure. badly and his individual performance is bad it's going to ruin his reputation and i don't think it ever should have gotten to the point where we should have been pointing the finger at device in any respect like even with this new change i hate i hate that he's now shouldering this new burden because like the fans right now love device and for good reason, because he consistently outputs at a very high level, even in bad situations. Well, now, now there's another reason to, to draw blame to him because he will perform worse. He will not call that well. And this team still might not succeed. So I don't, I think bro might fit a little bit better into some of the role for role spots for Yabby, but I don't think this even fixes the team by any means. What do you think then, Donna? Here's what we'll do. You, since yeah. you had a similar point, give your thought on this. I'll, I'll think of another bad one and we can just make sure we get the same amount of points. So, so what's your thoughts on this topic? Because you did have this is your ugly, to be fair, but because you put right, device right, IGL. Yeah. We'll just do your thoughts now on this topic and I'll do an extra one to because we sort of had a double point. I didn't notice that. So what do you think on this topic, the Astralis one? But should I mention it as an ugly point or not? I mean, just to give your answer, basically. Yeah, just give yeah. us what you think. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I had I have a lot of thoughts about Go for it. it. And I absolutely, uh, absolutely hate the idea of a device being the IGL now. Um, I know he said in an interview that um, he's like fine with it, but of course he has to do it. Like he cannot make the management look like they're forcing him to IGL. Maybe it was his idea, but I think if it was his idea and then just like out of like desperation to just like do something to help the team, I think device is like a very selfless player. He's a supportive player. He's a team player. He has experience. And I think he's one of the like... Uh, not not like the least selfish selfish uh, players who are who still can be stars and uh, i just really hate it because i was super excited for device in general to come back and i was very excited for the astralis lineup um nonetheless like all the drama about like Sav and jabi um i was like really neutral about it even though the community hated it and the community was like uh 
like you know throwing a lot of hate towards like this move and these players and whatever like on paper i was um, just excited that you know they're like doing something but i was also a bit skeptical because for me it sounded like they were doing a, a miscalculation here i think um it was good to get new players but i think what they needed from the beginning was an igl so maybe letting glaive go was never the the good decision here I would have tried either to get Glaive back or to get another uh, Danish IGL. I would have made uh, Blame After Star player, um, where he plays the best in, and I would have taken maybe Jabi, um, and not maybe both of them because the problem is also um, I'm just like throwing everything like yeah, it's I'm all good. Now, so it's maybe a bit chaotic, but um, I think like for me, what was a problem was having Blame F, Savan, and Jabi on the team. Like, you have uh, Stav and Jabi who both had a lot of space in Heroic, and uh, they were very good. They performed good. Some paper, they looked like good pickups because they are good players, 100%. But the reason why they were so good was because of the whole Heroic system. So the whole system was the reason why they were, like, uh, performing that well and why they were shining. And now they're being thrown into a new team where there is they don't have the system. And now you have, on top of that, Blame F, someone that takes a lot of space. And... Uh, so you know like they have like to share space and whatever and for me this is always such a risky move because you're signing players that look good on paper you don't know if they're okay with changing roles with playing different position with giving up some space you don't know how this works like they they they, they are like still young players and they have worked they have played for years now in this uh, heroic lineup where everything was good how do you know how this will actually um like work on practice, sharing space with someone like BlameF. On top of that, not having an IGL who is bringing that structure. For me, this was a huge risk, risky sign. On top of that, they spent two millions. And spending two millions is this, is this something also also that you tweeted? Uh, people are expecting uh, like that it's crazy when people expect that uh, Jabi or Stavn gets kicked because they didn't perform well after Astralis spent two million. It's crazy. You are right. Of course, they won't bench them. They spent two million of them. Uh, on them, but I think they should have not just done it from the beginning. Sure. I think they should have done taken only one of these players um, and taken an IGL instead of both of these yes. players. And now Blame F was the one who took the fall for it, from it. And I think it is unfair because Blame F, he has taken up the IGL role, even though he probably was not hyped to do it. And he was still performing well. And uh, I mean, yeah, of course, there's like this community beta or whatever, but he's performing and he's putting up the numbers. He didn't deserve to be benched, in my opinion. He was their best player. But they had no choice. And uh, now instead of like trying to say, okay, we're benching maybe someone after the major cycle to see if there's an IGL free, they decided to sign Bro, which role-wise he fits. I 100% agree. He has a, he's a decent anchor. He can give space to the others. But now they're forcing device to IGL. And I'm saying force. I, of course, don't know sure. uh, how it looks behind the scenes. But um, I think it is a terrible idea. And... Even though I think Device might be actually good at calling because Device had, he has worked with, with Azonic and Glaives for many years. Sure. He has a lot of experience. I think he knows uh, what calls to make. He 100% has the skill and knowledge for it. The problem is IGL is not just in the, on, happen, just doesn't happen only on the server. You have to prepare, you have to make game plans. You have to prepare, you have to watch demos. Of course, you have stuff for that, but you have to also work with the analysts, work with the coach to be up to date to know what's happening so device is gonna have a way a lot of more workload now um instead of like uh, focusing on his own performance he literally tweeted that he's not happy with his own performance right now and on top of that he's gonna do double the work so for me this is like tragic it is a tragedy and i really really hate that and i feel so bad for him and i don't know i think it was everything was mismanaged and miscalculated and now they're just trying to do some damage control Yes. By the way, on that, I will say one thing I hadn't even thought of Maui is, if you actually asked down in Yabby, how have you walked into another team where the AWP is the IGL? Like, do you all <laughs> learn? Like, do you have to do this three times before you figure out? It's probably not the best approach. And then, actually, I'm with you on the, like, if you could go back in time. Here's where Astralis completely misplayed their hand. If you go and look at the time span of when the moves happened... Dude, I actually am friends with Snappy, so I can tell you right now. For Snappy, the options were either Falcons, because you're going to get a super team and win the major and set your way to end your career on a high, or it was just stay with Ents. Well, I'll tell you what, if fucking Astralis had come to Snappy and said, you know what, mate, we're going to keep Blame F and fucking Device and we're going to get Stown, I think he would have taken that option potentially. That also might have been a real option. Remember, he is Danish. He could get to live in Denmark and all, and you could still potentially win the major. And by the way, if you had Snappy in that team, 
that I trust that you would make it work. You'd figure out a way. I know what I'll do. I'll make my, because we'll make that your ugly point. I'll make my bad point, actually, something you just mentioned, because I want to get Maui's take as well. It's what I said on Twitter, which is, I know that not every fan can keep track of all the news. Like, all the news is out there, and sometimes it's a rumor, sometimes it's a leak, sometimes it's the official thing. So when numbers get thrown around, it's why oftentimes people will quote, like, buyout amounts that might not actually be the buyout. That was just the first rumor of what it is. I get it that fans can't be as connected as people like us who are in the scene. But you have to think of it a bit like football, guys. If someone just signs like a £40 million striker to a Premier League team, even if he's bad the first five games, they're not kicking him out the fucking team. They just spent £50 million on him. So like, this is, what, this is what I'll make my bad point, is we can't keep looking at rosters like we're a HLTV forum poster from 10 years ago when it was just like, if a good team wanted you, you joined and you could always leave your old team and you could even break the contract. In the modern day, if we're signing players and we know they've been signed for millions, like Donna says, there's no world where they're going to bench fucking Yabby. They've just, it's taken all these months and millions of dollars to get the guy. They're gonna. The one thing they cannot do is consider him the problem and kick him out the team. Like, there's no way financially that will ever make sense. You have to give him another chance. You have to give him quite a lot of chances, actually. Him and Stown, because it was so much trouble to get them. And like I say, if they really got him because that was their guy who now runs the project from Heroic, he's not going to kick his boys like one tournament in, is he? So all I want, I'll make my bad point that in the modern day we can't look at rosters like money's no object and everyone will just join the teams we want. We've got to be a bit pragmatic and realize things like when you spend a lot of money, you are going to give that person extra chances. There's a reason why if someone was going to get kicked, that's why people were saying Steyr would get kicked. He did nothing wrong but he didn't cost $2 million. That's the reason why people are at least considering maybe that player can move. So I would just say in future, if you can, it'll just be it'll help these conversations a lot more, guys. If you just remember like real world pragmatic things like Money doesn't grow on trees and Astralis can't just go and get another five million and rebuild the whole roster. Like that's not a plausible scenario in Counter Strike at the moment. What do you think on this one, Maui? Well, this is I mean, I, the greater point I always have about this stuff is that why that's why it would be just so much better for this space and the discussions if we were had transparent contracts and we knew everything. Oh, if you had so like a bad. database you could just type in and see like right yeah. this but yeah, I agree, agreed. Yeah, because because sometimes I think that we we might tweet things and somebody says something like we're stupid, but it's like, well, we know what a little bit more behind the scenes about like what's going on there yes. in terms of contracts and everything and like I'm not going to explain every time I tweet, by the way, this person's on a 3-year deal where they're making 35k a month yes. and this person's making this much and that's why that's shaping my analysis every single time i just wish these numbers and figures were more public because they do all the time shape the things i say like i put way more uh i i like you know when i know like people think i'm being hard on skulls for example but it's like i know his contract now i know sure. some of the numbers around that like sure. so it's like i i think he deserve. i think he has to play better based off of those kinds of numbers and um yeah to swing it back to the astral side of things and make it bring it back in on this um yeah like like what you said with the you're, you don't really want to just sign someone like yabby who and have him perform badly and say "Ooh, three weeks later that's a bad move personally though that's why i kind of would have just kept the roster I, I don't think i don't think but then but that's why i would have kept the roster in its current state with blame f as igl even if he didn't want to do it and if device wants to call we'll let him call you know let him let him call and you sure. now have blame f who's yes. an incredible player on your team too but now it's like oh you're just trying to save money. You're trying to get a much cheaper bro on the team. And yes, maybe that'll activate Yabby a little bit, but you're losing out on a guy that's dropping like a 1.2 in every single tournament that he plays for you and is decimating all of his CT positions. So I don't really think that's like, that's a worthwhile trade just in terms of in server stuff. Just like, but I, but I know that it's about money too for these people. Sure. Right, let's move on. So obviously she did her ugly point. It was actually about just device oh, okay. being the idol, yeah, et cetera. Maui, point. give us yours. What is yours? Because you actually had another Astralis related one, but this is the spicy one. So Maui, set it up. What is your ugly point? Yeah, so so I think people that maybe were just... I, this this discussion didn't really go too many places. Like it didn't really make it to HLTV other than perhaps the forums or anything like that. But something that sort of set Twitter on fire for uh, about like a day and a half or so was the fact that the Astralis female player wanted the the women agents and so she wanted she wanted to bring in these these types of agents she wants to like she wrote that open letter it's uh josephine from the from the actual astralis <laughs> the astralis team and um she she wanted she's like 
the the wording on this is why I think there was a little bit of uh, of hostility and confusion there. But I think in essence, her point was more or less, and everybody else that she signed with on that Astralis women's team was that they wanted there to be at least one like a a female free agent in the game to so that there would be representation for women in Counter Strike. And some people, some of which in this call were actually against her idea okay. there that that should okay. be that there should be a female agent in there um, because there's maybe some more important matters. And I think that my by the way, low key, I'll that, even say specifically Donna's point was actually the joke is you could even just take the nameplate off. It could have just been a guy. She was just based. She was like, who gives a fuck about female agents? Just fix the fucking game. That was basically like her take. I don't say yeah. it like that. No, no, of course not. That was the gist though. That was the gist. Yeah. So, so I mean, my point, my point about this and why it's ugly is that. I'm on this this woman's side. I'm on I'm on Josephine's oh, side. Okay. I'm a as okay. a as a male feminist just like Anders Bloom. Yes. I, I am one, okay. I am one that that says, you know what, if this is if this if this if there's like a I don't think that there's a, a zero sum game here where I th I think that the the um I think Valve for example could be they're capable of putting in a, a female agent and I think it's a very little cost to them. It could be like nondescript. It could just have like a very generic woman's voice or whatever. I don't think these these 3D modeling things take way too long. Like I've seen Lydia, the the woman that uh, helped reskin Overpass, like she can make stuff happen in like a day. She can make she right. can make a whole model in a day of like a a, a yeah. 3D object that you could put in a game. And so I I feel like if Josephine and the other Astralis women want this, and uh, also some women wanted this beyond them, as as they were showed on Twitter in the discourse, then I would say that i'm all for it because for me there's no cost to me unless it literally hurt the gameplay and there is a discussion about like and i, I never saw anybody bring this up but it was my idea it was like will they look the same model the on the hit boxes and stuff i'm guessing right yes, i mean they would literally make them that same yeah would i would, I would yeah just just literally change the face um you know, and and then basically like make the proportions a little yes. bit more feminine. Yes. And I feel like that that would be totally fine if the hitboxes are all the same yes. and, and visibility is the same for that matter. So I'm like the joke is obviously point, she, yeah. the female agent can't be like super slim. So then you can't fucking off her if she like picks yeah, a car. Yeah. Obviously has to look the same like Quake has the same models in it. But I'm with you. I know that wasn't even a point brought up, but it would have been actually a decent counter. But no one thought it up, are we? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I think the response to this was mm -hmm. it went into too many directions, which I think kind okay. of missed the main thing of this, which is that representation makes people feel like they're more welcome in different spaces. And I know that I would appreciate more women being in this space because it's obviously great that we have people like like Freya, <laughs> Tech Girl, Shocks, and Donna here. Oh, there we go. I knew he's doing. I knew he was going somewhere. With that one. I knew it was going somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Come on, then, Donna. You were obviously part of this story. So, what do you think on this topic? I have a lot to say about this. So. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, first of all, um, I 100% agree. I think uh, it there's no harm in having them, and I was not against it, by the way. I think um, I worded myself a bit um, too short because I did an additional tweet on it. Um, the whole problem and why it was uh, taken so hostile by many people, why the response was like I think mostly negative, actually, uh, is the way they wrote it. I think if they would have just said, hey, we would we would think it's super cool if we would have a female agent, I think, honestly, no one would uh, give a shit. Like, people would say, oh, yeah, that's cool, or, nah, I don't care, you know, whatever. I think it would have not been, like, so dramatic. The problem why it was, like, taken so bad is that they literally wrote that Valve is supporting sexism by not right. having female okay. agents. Yeah. On top of that, saying that they're supporting the toxicity and whatever. So in kind of like a way, they played like the victim card saying we don't matter. We are just a guest at the party. And I think this is crazy to make this about female agent skin because, you know, I'm like, what actually bothered me was like, why are you wasting this letter that got so much attention for something like that? I mean, of course, like, first of all, I think for me, personally important are like, just like to fix the game. But outside of that, um, I also want to have more women in the scene uh, because I just like, I'm a content creator for many years and I've, uh, I have a very uh, close relationship with my community, of course. And I also have women in my community and believe me or not, but the number one reason for many women that stop playing the game or don't want to play the game or don't even want to try is toxicity and sexism. And imagine they would have like maybe tried to make it about that. Um, I think this would have uh, have a whole different response if maybe they would right. ask for some kind of like a ban system. In Faceit, you have that, for example. In Faceit, you can make All a support right. ticket. Okay. 
Um, actually, recently someone called me a fucking bitch in the first round because okay. I said uh, one thing. Well, you could have dropped me a uh, gun, you know, like fucking, I was just yeah. being a teammate and that, but you know, whatever. You know, and and uh, somehow an admin joined the face at Magic. I don't know how it was triggered or whatever. Maybe someone supported, but instantly we had an admin and he was nice for the rest of the match. Oh, the right. Game, okay. Super Fair cool. enough. Yeah, this would never happen to Valve servers. And the problem is if you actually like really like think um, from the, from zero, if you want to have more women playing the games, more girls, uh, they're going to start at zero, right? So they're not going to start playing Face It. Face It is for more, oh, sure. I would say, like, advanced players. Yes. They're going to play Premier. They're going to play matchmaking. They're going to get insulted 24-7 in nine out of 10 matches. And there's nothing they can do about it. You can... Uh, report them for verbal abuse, it will do nothing because they need a lot of reports in a day to get actually submitted. So nothing happens to them. You cannot make a support ticket. Yeah, they just get away with it. They keep doing it and keep doing it. And this is what like um, holds off so many like girls from playing the game and that makes CS unattractive for women. It's like really the toxicity and the sexism. And um, this is something that really bothers me. <coughs> um, of course, I deal different with it because I kind of like used to it that we just said. But um, if I would be new to this game, I think I would not play it, honestly, if I would get insulted just for being a girl. And I think like they kind of like missed the point, you know, they like their message. If the message would just be we want to have female agent skins because they're cool. No one would give a shit. I yes. would have not even commented on that. But they literally said this would cause more women to play the game. Yes, I think right. a few girls would play the game because there's a female agent. But for me. It's like, uh, I don't think that most girls will play CS just because there's a female agent. I think most girls actually don't care about it. They want to play the game because it's cool and they want to have fun playing the game, but they will get literally kicked out of the, uh, like kicked out of games and be like, I don't know, like, you know, the community is just like very hostile. And um, I think this was like the whole thing. Like they made the point that um, this is the reason why maybe, so, my, why maybe not so many women are interested in CS, but that is not true. And I think it was kind of like a waste to write a letter if they sure. would have made a normal post about it or whatever. Really, everything good. Or if they would actually not make that it's sexist to not have female agents, I think no one would care. But it was very written dramatically. Yes. And honestly, I don't even think that the girls wrote it. In my opinion, this looks like a, a Astralis PR move. It's just assumption here. So I, I feel also a bit bad for the girls that they got so much hate. Um, because there were, of course, a lot of toxic comments like, yeah, just go to the kitchen, classic woman demanding things right. like, you know, stupid comments. Um, I feel bad for this, um, but I think it was just like worded bad. And I think they really um, brought attention to something that is not the that is not the reason why women are not playing this game. And it's just my opinion. You can disagree with it. But uh, yeah, I think it's just like not the point, you know. Yeah, I will say, obviously, I was joking when I said the gist was like, just fix the game. So also, the bigger point was, I agree. The problem they had there was, I think they thought if we do the, like, we're being um, abused as women and this is going to help us, I go, I think they just thought that would emotionally make Valve think, oh, we have to do something. Whereas I agree with you. This should actually be two separate issues. There's one issue, which is, can we please just have female agents? It's not hard and people might like it. Like, what's the downside? Yeah, no one has a downside, but I agree. Yeah. If you just said that, the joke is, by the way, you also would have had so many male pros because it doesn't cost anyone anything. They would just go, yeah, why not Valve? It would have, you, your yeah. campaign would completely succeed, at least in terms of public response. I don't know what Valve would do, obviously. And I agree. Yeah. It's a totally separate issue of what are the things that stop women wanting to play the game starting as amateurs. Because as you say, the joke is, I would frame it this way if you're the people from Australis female. Right, when you join the server the first time as a woman and you go, excuse me, uh, can I take this spot? And then someone goes, hey, you fucking bitch, shut up. It's not like you'd go, well, at least I'm wearing the female skin though, so that's okay. <laughs> no problem, let's <laughs> roll on. I'll go, no, that wouldn't at all make your feelings better. So that yeah. is a separate issue completely. And I will say on that one, there's another detail people always miss there which actually I've seen on your Twitter you always show the videos of dude it's bad enough when people are shitty to you on the mic like it's bad enough you're a man and people are just shitty to you if you hear you have an accent or something but here's the thing CS especially is one of the hardest games to just mute in. Like, if you're in League of Legends, boys, there's not even voice comms in that game unless you're in your party. Like, you're just typing in that game. You absolutely can mute someone in League of Legends if they're typing yeah. rage shit and just play the game. The reason why you can't in CS is, by definition, like, think about if I play a game now, matchmaking on Premiere, right, and I don't use my mic, 
They're going to complain I'm not using my mic to come. So you actually do need to come and see us. And then secondly, even if you did mute them, it's not guys just somewhat, because this is where people are being stupid, because you haven't experienced it. You think that she joins the server and the person goes, fucking bitch, and then she could just mute him and have a great game. No, go and watch the videos on her channel and on her Twitter. They don't just fucking flame you. They grief you in the game. They do stuff like stand behind you the whole time, shooting you in the back of the head on servers that don't have height damage or like blocking you to make sure you get op opt around a corner or fucking messing up so you, the Melotov gets you. Like they do stuff that actually is just mega obnoxious. That's not even about like fucking, at that point, mate, like you're not even just being rude. You're just being a dickhead in the game. The worst thing about that is, think about this guy's. Here's an angle even if you're not a woman. There, If you're in that server as well, that guy's ruining your whole team experience yeah. too. Just to fuck with some woman who spoke on a mic once. Like that is obviously so beyond the fucking pale. So I would say people don't realize how bad the griefing angle is. Like they'll just fuck with you on that shit. And do, oh, and also do stuff by the way, like type in world, say where you are and say stuff like, oh, she's hiding now. So, this is the most obnoxious behavior to do to anyone. And then I'll also say there's an angle on the female agent thing that I don't think people have got. I've got two for you. One is here's why it's not as big a deal why I do think making it like big emotional stakes was a mistake. Guys, this isn't fucking Elden Ring. You play inside the model. You will never even yeah. see the model. You are the model. Like, if you play a third-person game, you're watching the model. That's why joke is there's a bunch of guys play those, like, MMOs as the female characters. It's cool to watch the yeah, one. Yeah. And obviously, the, <laughs> and the, sometimes the skin has, like, the fucking ass looks nice. And yeah, we all get it. We all know what the cynical angle is. But at least in a game like that, I'd get the idea of, like, I want to be that character. In CS, you don't really see it. So it's not the end of the world if you don't have it. But I will say this. This is an angle. I want to get Donna's take on this, actually where I do think there's a difference between girls and boys. I won't say women and men. I think specifically girls and boys when they're young because I actually saw someone make this point once, which is I have heard a lot of women say that when they watch like a TV show or a movie, they are sort of looking like, which character can I relate to? So then I can think of like their worldview and how they emotionally react to things because women have a different way of thinking about the world. So what I would say is this, is I think actually in some scenarios when they interact with media, women are looking for someone where they can say, that's me, that's, that's like me, I can relate to that whereas I would say the joke is I don't think boys are like that like the joke is there's a meme that was like this one time where it was like a bunch of women and they had female characters like them in the movie and they were like wow I can relate to that and probably, you probably know the meme I'm going to do and yeah, then the yeah. meme is there's like a Mexican boy like a black boy like a fucking Euro like British kid or whatever like a Spanish guy and then the joke is they're all looking Maui at like Goku who's not even like any race is he? he's like some weird anime character and the joke is all the boys are going that's literally me for real for real because that's what boys do <laughs> we don't need it to look like us in we're not thinking emotionally we're just like that's why I wish I was so I think this is one of those areas where boys and girls are different and so if you're a boy you might not want the character to you might not care but that doesn't mean it's not something they care about or would actually have a meaningful effect on them what do you think on that Donna do you have a take yeah actually um, I think it's true I mean I think general like probably a lot of like guys in the community cannot relate like to uh, care about it but um, I think also a lot of women to be honest because I have a lot of like uh girlfriends that are playing cs and are in the scene and obviously i've talked with uh, many of them uh, i also had like about this topic and i also was i did a stream right away right, right after the stream um and i had like a lot of girls also in my chat and uh, most of them also don't care that much about oh, okay. it and um that the ones that care were like yeah it would be cool but it doesn't change the game for me. What is most, uh, like, the most thing is, like, the toxicity. So, as I said, like, I'm really not against it. I think like, some people, like, per like proceeded as I was, like, against it. Like, no, like, I would probably use it, right, if I we would have, like, a female skin. Um, but, yeah, I just, like, think that... I also don't think that a lot of, like, girls in the scene uh, would say, like, oh, yeah, I identify myself with this, like, uh, skin. Like, it's really, like, more about, like, enjoying the game. And something that I also wanted to mention. Yeah, go um, It's that uh, you get, because you said you get griefed on. I just wanted to uh, yeah, go mention on. the grief thing. I'm not, for example, in my state, I'm not getting griefed as much, really, because I would say I am I have, like, a few, th like, 8,000 euro uh, hours in this game. So I play, like, okay. And, um, like, it's, like, harder to grieve me. You understand what I mean? Because I would, like, not have, like, five wrecks in every game. But if you're a new player, like, because this happened to me when I was new in CS, when I had 500 hours, I was not good. I had bot movement. I was, like, uh, barely killing anyone. I, would, I got griefed so much because, like, when you're a girl and you're, like, bottom fragging, that's the worst that can happen to you. You can literally not bottom frag. And, for example, there's a video that I shared after that post. I, I shared a video where a guy was, like, after we, I, the match was over, I said, GG guys, good games. 
like we won 35 easy match and then he was like doing spitting noises fuck you woman fuck you woman you know for no reason and i was not even bad at the game i had like 13 10 39 whatever i just like you know i was playing a side anubis nothing happened there whatever we won fast and then there were literally guys commenting yeah but he was carrying you right like you like you had the le least adr like this was like actually some arguments from some guys and this is really the reality like if you're like um if you're not like in the middle or carrying, then they think they have the right to uh, be toxic to you. And this will happen to a lot of girls that oh, start sure, playing yeah. the game just because they're not on a high level and they're like not good. It's normal. Like you're not good when you start playing the game. And um, that is like you will get grief 100 percent. So it's like such <clears throat> a huge, huge, huge problem. And for me, if there would be like one wish outside of fixing the game, I really wish like Valve would care enough to actually hire some people to make a support system. And like, so we could like ban these people and they would get cooldowns because then I think more girls would also play the game. Sure. So, By the way, one thing I also think would be cool yeah. because yeah. when people did the ESL impact thing and they also tried to tie it into like toxicity, the problem with that is that's pro level female count. Like that's not affecting, like she says, the person who's going to start the game tomorrow. It doesn't matter how good ESL yeah. impact is. That won't make the girl who joins Premier for the first time have a great time. One thing I do think would be cool is if you want to spend money on projects like that, here's a good idea. Go the other way. Do it grassroots level and make like a class level on like face it that are like women only servers or something or women's night or something where if you're a beginner, it's encouraged that you can join and maybe you get like a discount on face it or something and then you can just tell someone if you have a friend go play there to start with and you'll get your fundamentals up and then go and play a premier once like you say once you've got the skills to play and people aren't going to just target you as the low fragger because obviously people hate on the low fragger anyway but they're definitely going to do it if they hear you speak with a woman's yeah. voice as well so I actually think that'd be a better use of like funds if you want to encourage women to play the game make the grassroots experience the one that you improve not the pro as and goal but you do that yeah. last yeah exactly uh the I mean I just want to like bring up a couple couple stats here and stuff that well, just then. kind of like that with this that like I think one the the other comparison we can make though to Counter Strike is obviously Valorant because the games play sure. very similarly and the like the head of esports partnerships at at uh, Riot said that thirty to forty percent of players in Valorant are female which is even more than League of Legends oh for sure and it and so that that game obviously they did a lot. Because Riot, given that they were, had such a bad history with women and like were target like all the sexism claims yeah, yeah, and everything yeah. and alleg um, <laughs> all of that stuff going to court, they they clearly they clearly wanted to make sure that they fostered a better environment for women in this game. <laughs> and I think that I mean partially it is due in part to the fact that there was more there was better representation across the board. And I'm sure that there's other little things that they did too. Like if people get reported, I feel like I I feel like when I talk to the women that I know that play Valorant, because more women mm -hmm. in in North America spaces like i know more people now that play valorant than play counter-strike yeah. and it from from their perspectives it's not nearly as bad when they played valorant versus when they played counter-strike yeah. and so they're do in my eyes it just like if there can be a simple step taken to just add a female agent and it does anything at all if it even just slightly if it moves the needle like a millimeter i feel like that's a worthwhile endeavor for them and yeah there are other things we could do that would be a little bit like probably have greater impact and change mm -hmm. but if if some if a if a group of women want this and they think that it's and also again like it's a practically no charge to Valve to do this when sure. they're a billion dollar corporation, so I feel like there's just adding one super neutral basic female agent for T side and CT side would be of so little cost to them that it's 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 something that I just don't think should be swept under or think like. I almost don't even think we should have to like go to grassroots necessarily because it's like for Valve, this is just a drop in the bucket of a yeah. million things that they could do to foster a better environment. And probably, in fact, it would probably be profitable for them. If you get more women playing the game, that'd be better because mm -hmm. okay. like like um, another another like quick number is just like like before Valorant, the, there was another study that was published like a couple of years before Valorant, like how many women play FPS games. And it was like it was 93 percent men, 7 percent women. Sure. So for Valorant to have 30 to 40 percent of their That's player base huge. be women, it's crazy what they've done with that game. And so I just think that Valve needs to take a couple of steps just to make this experience feel a little bit more inclusive for uh, for a minority in this sure. space, obviously not a world minority. By the way, Can this this is a, th let me just quickly add this. This is yeah. a joke, but the other the thing they could obviously do if they really want to make people feel more comfortable and get quickly up to speed on the game is obviously the hard thing about Counter Strike is you have to learn all the maps. It's really complicated. Make a map based on Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what was your point there? What was the serious point? Come on. Yeah, I just want to say something to the Valorant point because um, I mean I know that more more women play Valorant, but 34% uh, is actually crazy. 
um, crazy good. And I think that's a great thing. But um, I feel like you could not do this in CS. Even if you would put a default female agent skin, um, I don't think you could get these numbers because it has just like a whole tif different vibe. Like, I think the reason why also Valorant is more popular is, first of all, you have like the uh, third, pers third person perspective, right? So you see like the whole model and everything. And it's like the whole, everything, how Valorant is designed. It is in general, like more colorful. Like they have like the skins, they look like normal people, not like super like buffed, like, you know, like uh, white people who were like 10 years in the military. You know what I mean? It's just like, um, I don't know. You also have like more feminine character characters where you would, for example, I would probably um, feel like better, like using a feminine uh, Valorant skin than uh, some, some like, you know, buff uh, city guy on CS, you know, but the thing is like, this will not happen in CS. Like CS is just like a different okay. game. It is more like simple, you know what I mean? And Cal sure. uh, Valorant with all like the abilities. I just like feel like it's more like um, mainstream friendly, not even women friendly. I think it's more mainstream friendly. And okay. CS is more like, I don't know, it's just like something that I think maybe sure. you have like, I don't know if you have uh, women in the community that watch your YouTube videos, but they can maybe comment on it. Um, like, I feel like CS is just like in general, how it looks and how it's designed. It's probably like just less interesting for mo most girls in general, you know, that compared to Valorant, which is way more like vibrant. It has more like like so many different things with the abilities, with the voice comes also like, you know, it's okay. just like it, it feels like more mainstream friendly for me. And I think that's maybe also one of the reasons why like more women play it. Thing is, you could actually be a Valorant character. What you could do is that what, what your 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 ult would be is if anyone references anything about a player you know personally, you just teleport right next to them on the map, and then just like they can't actually speak or use the mic comment. It cuts their mic, and only you're allowed to talk in the server. So that would be my suggestion. It's a cool idea. It's a little thing I'm working on there. It's all good. Right, okay, there's one point left. It's actually my ugly point. And this is one yeah. where I'm actually going to reference something from a recent interview I did. So I just did an interview with Config, who obviously now is in the scenario where he's leaving NIP. It was in for years and he had all that drama with Astralis. And he revealed something in this interview that is really shocking. So my ugly point goes like this. It's NIP's approach to how roles work in Counter-Strike. Because this is actually one of the most infuriating interview answers I've ever heard. So I asked him the obvious question, Maui, that I've been saying on every fucking one of our shows the whole time they've had that nip lineup, which is why did you recruit three players that sort of want to do the same thing? Res, Brolan and Config may as well be the same player in some ways. So you had three of them. And when you have three of those players, like at a minimum, one of you is not getting any roles and probably getting something really weird. It's worse than that, Maui. The obvious angle that would be bad would be something like you just pick arbitrarily. You do this one and he doesn't get the role. It's worse than that. They actually did the ultimate low IQ move. Are you ready? They just said, we'll do it by democracy and everyone gets like a map with their spot and then one where they're not on their spot and then they get a CT spot they like and then not a So he, yeah. Config even said, you could have like a best of three where like map one, you have like the star roles and you pop off and then map two, you're like on the support of one and then you don't get to do it. And it actually sounds like object, even though to a like, again, to someone in like a, an office who doesn't play Counter-Strike, that probably sounds really fair. I actually think that's the worst possible approach <laughs> to roles I've ever heard because what you're basically saying is, even if you literally are the best at this role you don't get it all the time and sometimes you just get the shit one like the joke is when i heard that mate the whole of that nip squad suddenly makes sense like now i get why all of them looked worse and it didn't work for anyone and at the end everyone was unhappy and they're all like backbite no wonder because you've had in that scenario what you actually needed was an adult in the room like threat or someone or dgl to go actually i'm gonna decide who has these roles so you know what like maybe i pick res maybe res is my guy in config you're not whatever i'd rather some like adult pick it so like i say the actual point i'm gonna make just the approach to roles like I, i've never heard of an approach like that it sounds like the worst fucking angle i've ever heard of me it sounds really bad <laughs> that that's uh man how do it's i it's wild isn't it i know man, it's like we can't get off the nip hate train game. <laughs> no, it just I know. doesn't let us go i thought i was off three stations ago but i'm back <laughs> so I, this i this i mean that team was just yeah, in terms of construction, just awful. I mean, I don't even like even and what's even funnier is when you had Hampus on the roster too, also wanting to do the aggressive roles. You practically have four, four aggressive riflers that are trying to do the exact yes. same thing. So that's just I mean, 
man, where do you even start? Like, oh, and then also your opera was, was. Remember, your opera was forced to be an opera. He used to be a rifle too. That's the thing I was just gonna say. You can't, you can't get a break. I was just gonna say that you got, a, you got an opera that only also just switched off of being an aggressive <laughs> rifler one season of a cat. We play Academy League ago, so it's like you have five people that actually all want to do the exact same job. It's amazing, and, then, and they actually found a way to be on the same roster, and for for somebody to think that was okay. Um, I, that's my piece. That's it. That's all I got on this one. Right, come on, Donna. If there's anyone cares about roles and space and all that, you you talk about space more than fucking NASA. So come on, hit me. What's your thoughts on this one? Come on. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, well, I don't even know what to say about the whole NIP thing. I feel like it was just like downhill since they. I don't know. I feel. I think with Alexi, they were, they were kind of good, and then it was just like, okay, we're gonna kick Alexi now and get Humbos back. It was all like very questionable for me, and since then, I feel like they have been on a. On a on a downhill, and I don't need, I don't I cannot even make any sense of this. I feel like they would have just like to fully rebuild. Um, about the roles things, um, I mean this is like always the thing. Like you on paper, it's it can work if you say like yeah, okay, you got your roles on this map. On this map, you get those roles. I actually know some teams that uh, or like you know like talk to players where they like tried that things. Um, also, I know that um, I don't know. For example. Let's, let's say OG, for example, like uh, with Next, I, I, I remember that they tried out different things because the players could not play all the roles on all maps the way they should. And then they were like switching, for example, then Next, I was like rotator on one map, but an anchor in the other map. It is catastrophic. Like you have no consistency with this. This is like really, really bad. And I think maybe it was similar for NIP. So they had like the priests and uh, they had like similar roles that were like, you know, in competition. And then they were like, just like trying to say, okay, you are doing the role good on this map and let's like switch it like this and like take roles from each other. I think this is the worst thing you can do. And this always just happens if uh, you pick up the wrong players in the end. <coughs> like uh, this is the only reason for it because in my opinion, um, you have like players that have a certain skill set that uh, have like the roles that they are uh, playing naturally and that they feel comfortable in. And um, if you like mismanage like the, the acquiring of, uh, of players, um, because you think this might work or they might be able to change this and that, then in the end, it's a problem of management here, in my, in my opinion, not the players, because in the end, the players are doing their job, but you don't know how they feel switching up roles. I mean, uh, this is like always like uh, such a question mark for me. I think similar, for example, also Vitality, if you look at it, Flames was like a full red rotator in OG, like he had all the rotator position in OG, and now he's taking up some anchor positions in Vitality. And honestly, Flames is an absolutely um, skilled, uh, gifted player, and uh, mechanically, uh, without a doubt, very good. But um, is he really good as an anchor on a lot of maps? He's doing a good job, but you know, you don't know how sure. how this is gonna affect long term. And I think <clears> this <throat> is always like so crazy when like management, coaching staff, or whatever are mis messing like with, with with players' roles that they played initially. It's always a gamble, in my opinion. I really don't like that. Um, and in the end, it's for me just like mismanagement. Yes. Right. By the way, at the end of this episode, I would just like to say thanks to Donna for appearing. If you don't know, I don't normally have streamers on, but it's just cool to have one that's actually knowledgeable about the game, grounded, and has a natural expertise in Counter-Strike. A lot of them are just kind of like, you know, fanboy casuals like Ola Pixel. 